crossed the room. Before she realized what he intended, he scooped her up in his arms and deposited her back on the bed, pulling the covers up around her before she had time to react. Stay there while I build up the fire, he ordered. She started to push the covers away again, but he simply caught her shoulders and shoved her back onto the bed. The next time you try to get out of the bed, you'll most likely regret it, he said in a lowered voice. At least at first. The threat in his voice was sexual. She wasn't so untried that she didn't recognize it. Then again, everything about Benedict Rohan seemed that way. His words were cold and clipped. The expression in his dark green eyes was threatening, but the fingers on her shoulders were absently caressing, the thumbs rubbing against the tight muscles, unconsciously soothing her. And then he released her turning his back, and headed toward the fire. She watched with astonishment as he built it up with the expertise of a man accustomed to such menial tasks, when most men would be helpless to accomplish anything so practical. The heat began to pour from the coal fire, and she realized she'd been shivering, holding her body tightly against the cool night air and her own fears. Her fears hadn't abated, but the room was filling with warmth, and he sat back on his heels, watching the flames with satisfaction. They threw his face into strange shadows, making him look half satanic in the flickering firelight. He looked up at her then, a meditative expression on his face. What in heaven's name made you choose that nightdress for your first attempt at seduction? he inquired lazily. And your hair? What's wrong with my hair? she said offended. This is what I wear to bed. This is how my maid does my hair so that it doesn't get tangled when I sleep. I do realize that demi-mondaines wear flimsy clothing, but I don't really have any, and this is how most women dress for bed. It is not, however, the way a woman dresses for her lover. If that's what you wore with Wilfred, then it's little wonder he was a sad disappointment. She flinched. Of course she'd considered that possibility, that her lack of real beauty and feminine wiles had been responsible for the failure that was Wilfred. While she hadn't communicated her uncertainties to Emma and the gaggle, they had made it quite clear that all a man really needed to enjoy himself was a naked, willing female and she'd definitely been that. Well, not particularly naked, but most definitely willing, and she'd let him do what he wanted. Which was disgusting. For some reason, the same base acts didn't seem nearly as foul when she thought of Rohan practicing them. And that had been her downfall. For the first time she'd considered sexual congress with a man and not felt ill, and she decided to act on that relative enthusiasm, only to be summarily rejected. I'm certain the unpleasant nature of my time with Wilfred was entirely my fault, she said in a cool voice, as she drew the shattered bits of her self-esteem back around her like the cloak she longed for. And you've made it very clear that you have no interest in me, but I've been too besotted to listen. Damn, where did that word come from? She quickly went on, hoping you wouldn't notice her slip. You have made me see the error of my ways, and I promise I won't suggest anything so untoward again. Now if you'd hand me my cloak, I will cease to bother you. He rose with that casual lazy grace that caught her eyes every time, and he drew his neckcloth out and tossed it on the foot of the bed. I am afraid, my pet— that you are doomed to bother me, and you're going to have to convince me that you've changed your mind before I let you go. It should have frightened her, outraged her, terrified her, disgusted her. Instead, as he started toward her with his lazy, sinuous grace, she felt that sudden clenching in her stomach, the tingling in her skin, and she knew if he touched her, she'd be lost. She wanted to be lost, didn't she? 
At least, that's what she'd thought several hours ago when she'd come up with this absurd scheme. Now, of course, she wasn't so sure. I don't think, she began, when he picked up the end of one of her plates and untied the ribbon, slowly pulling her hair free. She looked down at it, mesmerized, the tawny gold against his strong hand, the way he let it drift through his fingers. Hair had no feeling, and yet she could feel the caress in every inch of her body. He spread it out against her shoulder and then took the other braid, repeating the act, running the strands through his thumb and forefinger like fine silk. You really do have the most glorious hair, he murmured in that cool, detached voice. It's a crime to hide it in those dreadful bonnets. She couldn't move. She wanted to lift her hands to push him away, but she was frozen, if heat could freeze, staring up at him. He sat on the bed, and the mattress sank a little beneath his weight, and she started to roll toward him. She put her hands down to hold herself still, and he laughed softly. He leaned down and feathered his lips against hers, and unwillingly she responded, her body rising into the touch of his mouth, and she wanted to cry. She closed her eyes so he wouldn't be able to see the hurt and longing in her gaze. Let it be over soon, she thought dazedly. Let me just get through the next half hour, and it will teach me that I wasn't made for this sort of thing. I can survive anything. He kissed her closed eyelids, so gently, then her trembling upper lips, the arch of her brow, finally the lobe of her ear. And then he sank his teeth into it, biting her hard, and an electric shock went through her body as her eyes flew open in outrage and something else that she didn't want to examine. He sat back, an expression of bemused satisfaction on his face. Besotted, are you? That should make my job a great deal easier. He rose, and she felt a momentary panic. He was going to let her go. He'd made his point. She was really terrified of doing this no matter what she said. Now he would send her away and she would go, defeated and humbled, and she'd never be fool enough to— He had shrugged out of his jacket. No mean feat, given the perfect fit of the garment. He unfastened the shirt studs and set them on the table beside him, slowly exposing his sun-darkened skin to the candlelight. And she took a swift breath. Wilfred had been very pale and thin, almost scrawny. Thomas had been covered with grizzled grey hair. She thought Rohan was thin as well, but she'd been wrong. He was all sleek muscle and tan skin as he stripped his shirt off. And she stared at him, conflicting emotions roiling through her. She cleared her throat searching for some kind of normalcy in the charged air. Well, it's no wonder I'm drawn to you, she said in what she hoped was a pragmatic tone. You're ridiculously beautiful, and you know it. He was amused. Do I? Of course you do. Now she could be acerbic with no effort. You carry yourself that way, like a man who knows his own worth and recognizes his value. You stroll and swagger and move like a pirate, surveying his prey. He let out a hoot of laughter as the snowy white shirt fell onto the floor. And just how many pirates are numbered among your acquaintance, he asked politely. She wanted to come up with a clever response, but the sight of all that bare flesh momentarily silenced her until he reached for the fastenings of his breeches, and she let out a strangled cry. Don't! A look of irritation crossed his face. Sweet charity, if I wait much longer to shuck my breeches, I'll have a damned hard time getting them off. It's not as if you're a virgin. You've seen a man naked before. No, I haven't. He paused, then shook his head in disbelief. 
It's little wonder you have no idea what you want. Your initiation has been criminally botched. My husband was elderly, she said, trying for dignity, and ill besides. Then why did you marry him? He was my only choice. He looked even more incredulous. I don't believe you, he said flatly. The men of London aren't all such blind idiots. He couldn't have said anything more certain to soothe her ravaged pride. I don't think my aunt would have lied to me. I didn't have any money. I was far too serious and I didn't take. I was lucky to get Sir Thomas. Sir Thomas had thirty thousand pounds a year, and he would have made a generous settlement on your cousin as well as yourself. If anyone less plump in the purse came along, I expect she would have sent them about their business. She wouldn't have, Melisande gasped. Benedict sat in a chair by the fire and proceeded to pull off his shoes and stockings. You are still astonishingly naive, he said, leaning back in the chair. Next thing you'll be insisting that I don't want you. That was enough to bring her head up. I am fully aware that you feel a certain physical response to my proximity, she began. But I also know that anyone can arouse that reaction in a male. It means nothing. His smile was grim. I'm not that easy, my precious. I prefer my bed partners adventurous and experienced. You're going to be hard work and nothing but trouble. Then why don't you unlock the door? she snapped. Because you'll be worth it. His voice was soft then, and he rose, pinched out the candle by the chair, and approached the bed. I don't— Stop talking, Melisande, he said, sliding his hands behind her neck and cupping her chin with his thumbs. We've already wasted too much time. He put his mouth against hers, and this was no sweet salute. No soft seduction. With the pressure of his thumbs, he pushed her mouth open beneath his, and she felt his tongue against her, tasted him, dark and hot and sweet. She should argue. She should fight. She did neither. She lifted her arms and slid them around his neck, dancing into his kiss. He pulled her down on the bed, covering her and the feel of his hot skin against her hands was a shocking intimacy. His fingers brushed her throat, and the collar of her nightrobe began to part. He moved his mouth away from her, down the line of her jaw to the hollow of her throat, heated breath warming her as he slowly unfastened the row of tiny buttons that usually took her so long to fasten, his mouth lazily following the exposed flesh. She still had the covers around her, and he pulled them away, pushing them off her. The heat from the fire had begun to fill the room, and she closed her eyes, feeling his mouth on her skin. His hands moved up and covered her breasts, and she jumped, momentarily startled, then subsided as he stroked her, slowly, into a kind of day's submission. She was doing this. She was really going to do this, she thought. Her nipples hardened against his fingers, and the sharp intensity of the pleasure was almost painful. He was watching her, rubbing his thumbs back and forth across her breasts, and the feeling burned straight down to that place between her legs. Don't, she gasped, afraid of the sensation. Don't be absurd, my pet. This is simply pleasure. You need to learn to get used to it. She sucked in her breath, wanting to squirm. It's uncomfortable. He laughed. Sex isn't about comfort. At least, not what lies between you and me. It's hot and hard and aching, and it won't feel better until we're finished. Then why do it? She whispered dizzily because it feels so good. And he set his mouth against her breast, sucking at her, and she let out a strangled cry. 
It was too much. And it was not enough. He'd pushed the nightgown down to expose her breasts, and the sight of his head down against her, drawing her into his mouth, made that ache grow stronger still. He put his hand on her other breast, his fingers dark against the pure white of her skin, plucking at her, and she let out a low, long wail as the burning grew hotter, harder. He lifted his head to look at her. Touch me, he whispered. Put your hands on me. She realized she'd been lying there like a virgin bride, clutching the sheets in her fists. She released them, slowly lifting her hands to touch his shoulders. They were rock hard with tension, and there was no shirt to cling to, only warm, smooth flesh. He seemed satisfied, though, and lowered his mouth again, this time to her other nipple, and she wanted to cry out, to beg him. She didn't, because she had no idea what she'd beg him for. He pulled his mouth back and ran his tongue across the distended peak, causing her to gasp in reaction. And then he blew on the dampness, cool in the heated air, and her fingers dug into her shoulders as she squirmed on the mattress in mindless need. Let's get this over and done with, he muttered, climbing off the bed to reach for the fastening of his breeches. She didn't plan to look. She knew she should be curious, but both Thomas and Wilfred had been so secretive about their rods that she suspected there was something shameful about them. But Benedict had already stripped, and it was too late to look away. She simply stared in awe. He was magnificent. His torso and legs were long and lean, muscled and strong. He didn't have the thick mat of hair that had covered seemingly every inch of her husband's body. His chest was smooth, with just a bit of hair in the middle, moving in a line down below his waist, setting off the jutting erection he somehow thought was going to fit inside her. No, she said, shaking her head. You're too big. He laughed then. There's something to be said for having such an ingenuous lover. Merci du compliment. It will fit. She opened her mouth to protest, but he simply silenced her with his tongue, climbing onto the bed beside her, and started pushing off the rest of the nightgown. You really want me naked? she whispered, still uncertain. I really want you naked, he said, moving his mouth to the sensitive skin between her neck and shoulder, biting her gently as his hands divested her of the voluminous nightgown. And now they were both naked in the bed, and she knew there really was no going back. It should have frightened her. Instead, it empowered her and she reached up to touch his long, thick hair, as she'd wanted to do countless times before, letting her fingers sift through the silk strands, wishing she could bring it to her mouth, to taste it. His mouth was moving down, kissing her, licking her, biting her, and she arched up in delight, wanting something, not sure what it was. For God's sake, would you please touch me, he said in a strangled voice. She blinked. But I am touching you. I mean my cock. It took her a moment to realize what he meant. He took her hand, drawing it down his chest, and she shivered in delight, entranced with the feel of his hot skin. And then he placed it around him, the hard, silken part of him, and she tried to pull her hand away in sudden shyness. He held her there wrapping his fingers around hers so that she had no choice. She cupped him, and he drew their hands up and down the rigid length of him, and she heard him groan in pleasure. How do you feel? he whispered in her ear, his voice rough. She was so caught up in the feel of him that it took her a moment. Afraid, she said finally. A little bit. And, and, 
restless, needy, wanting, she said, shocked at herself. He kissed her. That's good. Anything else? She kept moving their hands in unison. And... And wet, she said, knowing she was blushing. The one candle that still burned offered little illumination, just enough to embarrass her. He smiled then, and kissed her again, full and open-mouthed. Good. You've had me hard for days. It's only fair that I should make you wet. But, but— His hand released hers, but she didn't let go. Instead, her grip loosened, and her fingers touched him, glanced across the hot skin, the rigid protruding veins, the flared head. It still seemed mysterious, but as she let her fingers learn him, she felt reaction shudder through his strong body. He moved then, pulling away from her, lying on his side next to her, watching her out of hooded eyes. She had the sudden fear that she'd hurt him, offended him, but the intent look on his face made her skin heat. Relax, sweet charity, he said softly. I'm just going to make sure you're ready. His hand covered her stomach, warm and strong, and she shivered in response as he moved it down between her legs, his fingers slipping through the curls into the wetness, and he closed his eyes, smiling. Oh, my precious, you most definitely are ready. I had so many other things in mind— but I'm afraid I'm simply going to have to take you now. I'll have to lick you another time. But you did. My breasts. Not there, he said, brushing against her hard nipples. Here. And his fingers slid inside her. She arched up in shock, crying out. He stroked her, slowly, spreading the wetness around, and then he moved between her legs, and she tensed, knowing what was coming, knowing it was going to be miserable. The touch of him against her silenced her, stilled her. She was trembling, trying to hide it, but lying naked beneath a man made subterfuge almost impossible. I'll stop if it hurts you, he said, pushing against her. We'll go slow. Just tell me how it feels. She trusted him. She'd forgotten that salient point. She trusted him. She nodded, unable to speak, bracing herself, and his smile was so sweet it almost shattered her. No, my love, this isn't a torture chamber. Relax. I c can't she stammered, shivering despite the warm of the air. I'll help. And leaning forward, he bit the top of her breast, just hard enough to shock her into loosening her muscles. At that he pushed into her, so hard, so big, and she should tell him to stop, tell him that it hurt. And it did hurt, just a little bit. So little, that the pain was almost a kind of pleasure, and she shifted, lifting her hips, needing more of him. Am I hurting you? His mouth was against her ear. More, she said, her voice ragged. Please, more. He held himself still for a moment, and then he pushed, slid deep, filling her, and she cried out, arching against him, taking him. He began to thrust, slowly at first, watching her, and she knew he was afraid of hurting her. She wanted to scream at him, to demand, to beg. Did she want him to leave her body? Did she want him to slam into her? She needed something so desperately, and she didn't know how to reach it. His hands cupped her hips, angling them. He continued to thrust, ignoring her efforts to speed him, slow and hard and deep, each push one more claim on her body, and she felt the darkness begin to bubble beneath her skin, 
felt the need blossom and grow and spread through her body, reaching every inch of her skin, tiny pinpricks of reaction. It wasn't too late, she thought desperately. She could make him stop. She didn't have to go to this terrifying place he was taking her, where nothing existed but the man inside her, their bodies joined, sweating, slapping together. There was no escape. She didn't want to escape, but she kept fighting, pushing it away. Stop it, Melisande, he growled in her ear. Take it, claim it. No, she sobbed. Take it, he said again, hard inside her, slamming into her so that the bed shook and her body trembled and she knew she would break apart and she couldn't stop, couldn't stop shaking, couldn't stop crying, couldn't stop. She froze as an endless, keening delight stiffened her body and tore away the lust of her defenses. She felt him cry out, spill inside her, and she welcomed it all, the wet heat of his seed, the shaking of his body, the crazy mad delight that caught her in its grip so tightly she thought she would never unravel. And then it loosened its hold, and she fell back on the bed, panting, weeping, taken and destroyed. He collapsed on top of her, his chest heaving, and she could still feel him inside her. She still shivered around him in her fading response. He released her then, rolling to his side, and she was suddenly so cold. Covered in ice, she thought dizzily, knowing she had to get away. She'd been wrong. He'd been right. This was a terrible idea, because she'd needed him too much, and the having and the letting go were too painful. She wondered if her legs would support her if she tried to get out of bed. Men fell asleep afterward, didn't they? How long could she safely wait? And then, to her surprise, he pulled her into his arms, tucking her close against him. You're not going anywhere, he said sleepily. We've only just begun. She didn't question him. She would stay there as long as he'd have her. Lie in his arms to the break of day and beyond, anything he wanted. And while she waited for him to fall asleep, she drifted off herself, lost in exhausted oblivion. 26. Benedict lay on his back in the slowly gathering dawn. His body felt so richly sated that any move on his part would require superhuman effort, and he had no intention of attempting it. He felt... He could think of no adequate word for it. Confused was inadequate, shattered to emotional when he was a man who eschewed emotions, he lay in his own bed, the bed he'd never shared with anyone, and listened to her breathe, deep in sleep. He'd worn her out as he'd planned to. He'd taken her to places she had no idea existed, again and again. He'd taken her hard, he'd taken her fast. He'd made love to her with heartbreaking tenderness. She was the one who was supposed to be shattered. Instead, she slept, and he lay beside her, his mind in turmoil. Damn her. He should have simply shagged her the first chance he had, and those occasions had been numerous. He'd recognized the sensuous nature beneath her practical exterior, and it would have taken very little effort to have her and then dismiss her. He had no interest in a long-term mistress— and there was no reason why he should be hard again after last night, wanting her, unaccountably furious with her for sleeping so soundly. He forced himself to move, slipping from the bed and heading into his dressing room. The dim light from the early dawn gave just enough light for him to see her discarded clothes on the slipper chair, and he gathered them up once he'd pulled on his thick wool banyan. He came back into the now chilly bedroom and looked down at her. She looked like a child, 
an innocent, sweetly sleeping, though he knew for a fact that she had to be at least thirty years of age. Even if he were insane enough to consider marrying, she would be the last person he would choose. She was too old to be of prime childbearing age, and since she'd spent ten years of married life without conceiving, she was most likely barren. His only reason for considering marriage was to provide an heir, and Melisande Carstairs wasn't the way to do it. He was better off with her as far away as possible. There was no earthly reason for the sex to have been as disturbing as it was. She had no skills, no experience. He'd had to coax her and please her when he was used to being the one who needed to be pleased. She was simply wrong. He'd always known it. And the impossible hours they just passed simply proved it. And the longer he stared down at her, the harder he became. He dumped the clothes on top of her, and she awoke with a start, momentarily disoriented. She sat up, realized she was naked, and quickly pulled her discarded clothes against her body, covering herself. Her eyes narrowed as she saw him, and a rich color rose to her cheeks, suffusing them, and he could see her mouth, soft, tremulous, uncertain. I would suggest you dress and return home before it's full light, he said, his voice clipped and distant. Why? Damn the woman! Didn't she know a dismissal when she heard one? He needed her dressed and out of there, before he changed his mind and threw away everything he'd planned so carefully. I wouldn't want the gaggle to jump to any conclusions. What kind of conclusions might they jump to? He wanted to strangle her. He wanted to wrap his hands around her neck and hold her still while he kissed her. That this was anything more than a momentary lapse on your part and a mistake on mine. I've done my duty, aided in your education, and now you're free to apply that knowledge in a more suitable direction. She was very still. No expression crossed her face. But then she was good at hiding her reactions. He wondered if that was pain in her dark blue eyes. If so, that was a good thing. It would make the lesson stick. Indeed, she said finally. Have you already taught me everything you know? It was a worthy comeback, and he fought his admiration. All that you're capable of assimilating? I believe I made myself clear. If there was a chance in hell I'd ever find myself harboring any kind of feelings for you, I wouldn't have succumbed to the very ripe temptation you offered. Awkwardness and enthusiasm is an interesting change now and then, and I won't deny I enjoyed myself, but in general I prefer a more sophisticated pleasure. Go find some earnest young man who'll share your charitable activities and leave me alone. She blinked. Such a small reaction to his deliberately brutal words, and he wanted more. He wanted to lash out at her, to cause her the same consternation that she'd caused him. But she simply looked at him for a long moment, and he had the odd feeling that she was taking his cruel words and translating them in her brain, as if from a foreign language. I see, she said after a moment. Perhaps you would be so good as to summon your carriage to drive me home, or would you prefer I take a hackney? He refused to flush. My carriage will be at your disposal, madam. And would you also allow me to dress in private? I find I have no interest in displaying my body in front of you. Trust me, it would have no effect on me, he said, ignoring his damn direction. In truth, he wasn't sure he'd be able to continue with this if he saw her naked once more. The curve of her pale breasts, the soft perfumed skin, the tawny curls between her legs, the very thought made him break out in a cold sweat. And what about the heavenly host? He had already turned toward the door. You may trust me to take care of the situation. But I don't, she said softly. I don't trust you. He remembered her words from the night before. 
She'd told him she'd chosen him because she trusted him. He'd managed to do an effective job of smashing that trust. Very wise, but I give you my word. There will be no murders on the night of the full moon. She didn't respond. She merely looked at him, seemingly calm and unmoved. And yet he remembered her body clenching his, remembered the shuddering climax that had shaken them both. He could see the mark his mouth had made at the top of one breast, and knew there would be others on her sensitive skin. He remembered when she had sunk her teeth into his shoulder rather than cry out, and the spur that tiny bit of pain had forced. Goodbye, my lord. Even then he wanted to change his mind. Wanted to cross the room in two swift strides, pull her back into his arms, and kiss her senseless. Wanted to bury his aching cock in a sweet, welcoming body, drinking in the richness of her response. He gave her a nod and left the room, before he made an even bigger disaster of his life than he already had. She pushed the covers back, looking down at her body. She was damp and sticky between her legs. The last time he'd been too tired to do anything more than collapse on top of her, and they'd slept. Or so she thought. He'd washed her the other times, gently ministering to her, and she'd let him. Foolish, foolish woman. The room was cold, the fire out, and she looked down to see her nipples puckered against the icy air. There was a red mark on her breast, another on her thigh, and she closed her eyes for a moment, remembering. She was made of sterner stuff than that, she reminded herself, opening them again. This was all working out for the best. She'd chosen Benedict Rohan for one reason and one reason alone. He was purportedly a brilliant lover. If the previous night was any judge of his skills, he'd been sadly underestimated. He was astonishing. So good that even with his cruel words echoing in her ears, she'd still lie down for him if he wanted her. So now she knew. The pleasures of the flesh were, in fact, desirable. And how much more delightful they'd be with someone she loved. She could now search out a good, decent man to marry, and, perhaps with a miracle, bear children. She wanted to be a mother. She now had enough information to ensure that the next man she fell in love with would be able to bring her pleasure as well. She needed to get home swiftly, to make notes as to what had been most pleasurable so she wouldn't forget. And then she would instruct her future husband— there was a strange choking noise in the room, and she looked around her, appalled, then realized the sound came from her own throat. She swallowed convulsively, shoving the pain back. She was being ridiculous. She washed swiftly with the now icy bowl of water before dressing. She was shaking from the cold, and perhaps something else, but she wasn't going to consider that possibility. When she finally rose to her feet, her ankle almost gave way beneath her, and she welcomed the pain, a distraction from what she refused to consider. Her cloak lay across the chair by the dead coals, and she wrapped it around her shoulders, pulling the hood up over her face. She found the walking stick she used to help her perambulate, then opened the door, half afraid she'd see him again. She wasn't quite sure she'd managed to keep her icy calm much longer if she had to look at him again. Into his dark green eyes, cool and assessing, at his beautiful distant face. Someone was waiting for her, and she almost jumped when she recognized Rohan's majordomo. Your ladyship, he said, his voice soft and inexpressibly kind. Your carriage is waiting. I've had it brought to the side portico. There's less of a distance for you to walk on your bad ankle. That's very kind of you. She struggled for a moment, then remembered his name. Richmond, she added, and was rewarded with his smile. 
It's my honour, your ladyship. May I offer you my arm? She took it. She didn't want to lean on him, didn't want his kindness, but she really had no choice. They made their way down the flights of stairs with stately grace, and the pain was a welcome distraction from that stronger, bleaker pain inside her. By the time he handed her into Rowan's town carriage, she was biting her lip to keep from crying out, a film of sweat covering her forehead. She'd been an idiot as always. If she'd simply stayed home, as Rohan had instructed her, this never would have happened. She would be in happy ignorance of the wonders of the flesh, and she could continue to think of Rohan as an annoyingly attractive thorn in her side. She sat very still on the seat as she was conveyed the short distance to King Street, and she directed the coachman to take her around to the back, to the garden entrance, rather than up the twelve steep marble steps to the front door. She was handed down with great care, far more care than Rohan had ever shown toward her, and she limped up onto the terrace, pushing open the French doors that led to what once had been a salon and now served as a sewing room. The house was still and quiet, the gaggles still asleep in their chaste beds, while she had been carousing. She couldn't think of them as the gaggle any longer. That had been his term for them, and he was no longer any part of her life. She moved into the deserted hallway, glancing up at the interminable flights of stairs. She couldn't face them. She went into the front room, where she and Emma both had desks, and sank down on the chaise, leaning back and closing her eyes. The morning was still and quiet and beautiful, and she had a new life to begin. What a glorious morning! How delighted she was with her little experiment, and how good it was that Rohan had retained his boredom with her while proffering her exquisite, sublime pleasure. Indeed, life couldn't be much better. Are you crying, miss? A small anxious voice came from the general vicinity of the banked fire, and Melisande made a damp, choking noise as a bundle of rags emerged from the shadows. It took a moment for her vision to clear through her streaming tears, and she saw Betsy's bright young face, creased in uncharacteristic worry as she looked up at her. For a moment, Melisande's voice refused to obey her. She struggled then managed to come out with something faintly akin to a conversational tone. My ankle is paining me, Betsy. Yes, miss. Betsy was still proving remarkably stubborn when it came to proper forms of address, and Melisande knew she should instruct her in the proper form. Your ladyship for a titled female, miss for an untitled one. On no account was she a miss. And yet Betsy persisted, possibly because the only comfort and safety she'd known had been provided by a miss long ago. Melisande swiftly wiped the dampness away from her cheeks. What are you doing up so early, Betsy? Betsy moved into the light, and Melisande could see that the child had been crying as well, and her own heart turned over. I couldn't sleep, miss. I curl up down here when I can't. That way, when Eileen comes back, she'll be able to find me right away. It took all Melisande's self-control not to wail. Eileen wasn't coming back. Of that one thing she was absolutely certain. Whether the heavenly host had murdered her, or Eileen had simply run off to a place where she didn't have to work quite so hard, Melisande didn't know. She only knew she wouldn't be back. You need your bed, child. You do as well, your ladyship. Melisande smiled briefly. For once, Betsy had got it right. I'll tell you what. You and I will both go up to our beds. I'll leave word with Mrs. Cadbury that you're to be allowed to sleep late today, and by the time we're both up and dressed, we'll both be feeling much better. Does that sound like a good idea? Betsy looked at her doubtfully. I don't think I'll be feeling better until Eileen comes back. 
I don't know what I can do if she doesn't come home. She yawned unselfconsciously, and for the first time that morning, Melisande felt like smiling. You can stay here for as long as you want to, she said and paused. If Eileen doesn't come back, you still have more than twenty women who'll be your older sisters. Not Cook, Betsy said judiciously. She says I get in the way. She's more like a mum. But she says I might not be a total disaster in the kitchen. Melisande did smile then. That's good news. If you learn to cook, you'll always have a job. Violet says working's harder than lying on your back. I think she's wrong, though. She is wrong. If you don't feel like sleeping, you could go down to the kitchens. Cook is usually awake by now, starting the bread. She could use the help. Yes, miss. Your ladyship had been forgotten once again, but Melisande simply nodded. If Molly Biscuits was taking Betsy under her wing, then the child would be well looked after and well trained. One less soul she had to worry about. She waited until Betsy had vanished, then struggled to her feet. She needed her bed. She needed a bath to wash away the taste and the touch and the scent of him on her skin. It was time to put that part of her life behind her. She had no choice but to trust his word. He would stop the heavenly host. In the meantime, she had to move ahead with her own life. The wicked temptation of Benedict Rohan belonged in the past. The future lay bright and bold in front of her. All she had to do was get through the next twenty-four hours, and she'd be fine, perfectly fine. She locked her bedroom door. She cried as she washed herself, cried as she took her clothes and shoved them into a hamper, cried as she took a clean shift and drawers, new stockings and garters, and then climbed into her narrow bed. It wasn't until she closed her eyes that she remembered he'd lain with her in that bed his body covering hers as his deft fingers pinched out the candlelight, leaving them alone in the darkness. And it was then that the foolish tears finally stopped, as the pain wrapped around inside her, crushing her into silence. She rolled over onto her stomach, burying her face in the soft feather pillow, wondering if it was humanly possible to smother oneself. It didn't matter. It was over. Time to move on. There was still laudanum in the bottle beside the bed. This time she didn't hesitate. She took her dose, swallowed it, and closed her eyes, waiting for oblivion to come, for the waves of pain in her ankle to cease. It took far too long. In the distance she could hear Emma's voice calling someone, but it wasn't her. And it didn't matter. They could wait. Just for this one day, she wasn't going to take care of anyone but herself. Just this one day. 27. Benedict was a man who could hold his liquor. At times in his life, he'd been a three-bottle man and still been able to hold an intelligent conversation and make his way home without stumbling. The ability to drink and not show it was almost more important to being a gentleman than paying one's gambling debts, and when he was seventeen years old, his father, a reformed rake and ne'er-do-well, had taught him those salient social graces, much to his mother's annoyance. Then again, Charlotte Rohan had always been alarmingly strong-minded. She'd had to be, to deal with his charming father's ways, and Adrian Rohan had ended up being that most original of creatures, a devoted husband, much to his secret embarrassment. Like father, like son. It didn't matter that the world considered the Rohans to be profligates and degenerates. The moment they found their soulmates, they became, if not the epitome of righteous behavior, at least excellent husbands. Even his distant cousin, Alistair, one of the founding members of the Heavenly Host, had retired to Ireland with his English bride and lived out an exemplary life, breeding horses and children and worshipping his wife. 
His own grandfather, Francis Rohan, had been the stuff of legend, which had been difficult to imagine when he thought of the charming and devoted old man he'd adored. He'd been unable to keep his eyes or his hands off his plump grandmother, much to his father's embarrassment. But in truth, his father was just the same. Benedict had had every intention of following in the family tradition. He'd sown his wild oats, even attended a few of the waning gatherings of the heavenly host before falling in love with Annis Duncan. They should have lived happily ever after, with that same comfortable devotion that had been a shining example. But apparently his generation was cursed. His darling Annis had died, and he could no longer remember what she looked like. His second attempt had been disastrous, confirming the suspicion that the luck of the wicked Rohans had run out. His brother Charles had married a prig, his brother Brandon was courting ruin and an early death, and his sister Miranda had married her kidnapper, a master of thieves, for God's sake, and had the effrontery to be happy about it. Benedict leaned back in his chair, eyeing the brandy bottle with a jaundiced eye. He'd been drinking steadily, pacing himself, in order to blot out these very thoughts that were plaguing him. Better to think about his family than that other horrific memory that was eating at his stomach and heart and soul, assuming he even had a heart and soul. He took leave to doubt it. He reached for the brandy bottle, missing, and then clasped it. He spilled more than he managed to get in the glass, and he decided it might be wise to forego the glass altogether for the next round. Less trouble for the servants. Why he should care about the servants was beyond his comprehension, but that was his mother's influence again. Why couldn't he have had some distant mother who never saw her children and left their upbringing to capable nannies, then he wouldn't be plagued with such ridiculous concerns like fair treatment for the servants, responsibility for his siblings, general decency. And he wouldn't be doing his best to blot out the memory of his evil, vicious tongue. He was capable of being a nasty son of a bitch, and he knew it. He'd proved that early this morning, letting his evil inner demon free to slash and hack like a medieval warrior leaving his victim broken and bleeding on the ground. Except that he wasn't a medieval warrior, and his weapons had been words, not maces and broadswords. Words that were lies, slashing at the woman he'd just made love to, destroying her until there was nothing left. He could still see her face, calm, unmoving, the utter bleakness in her dark blue eyes. He'd managed to smash Charity Carstairs's infernal amour propre, gotten through to the heart of her, the soul of her, and crushed her. He drained the glass, he realized, and he could still see her. He reached for the bottle and took a deep drink, letting the fiery taste of it slide down his throat. He should see if he could get some good Scots whiskey. That would work even better than French brandy. Too bad the British weren't as adept at creating something to knock a man on his arse. He could ask his brother the direction of the opium den he habituated, if he got desperate enough. Anything to forget what he'd done. But Brandon had disappeared and wouldn't return. At least not until the infernal fraternity lost its hold over him. The opium would still lay claim to his soul— but Benedict would help him deal with that when the time came. He cursed, with long, inventive, impossibly obscene phrases. He had the unbearable suspicion that he wouldn't be able to save Brandon, that no matter what he did, he couldn't stop the spiral of self-destruction that was driving him any more than he was able to save his sister from her disastrous marriage. He took another swallow, letting the blissful veil of confusion float down over him. There was something else he was trying not to think of, something that kept pushing through to torment him.
It had something to do with Charity Carstairs. Melisande. A beautiful name for a beautiful woman. Creamy skin, magnificent breasts. Sweet little sounds when he took her, delicious shudders when she climaxed, shock in her eyes each time she reached her peak. He'd shown her, hadn't he, he thought dismally. Taught her just what she was missing and then made sure she'd never seek it out again, if cruelty was the price she had to pay. Why had he done it? He was adept at ridding himself of females he'd lost interest in, all without offending them. But maybe that was the problem. He hadn't lost interest in her. He'd become so wretchedly obsessed and entangled with her after one night of sweaty wicked delight that he'd panicked. He was supposed to hold his liquor, treat women with civility, and never show fear. He'd cocked that up to a fairly well. His mother would be horrified. His father would thrash him. No, he wouldn't. Too big to thrash. Besides, his father always hated to punish him. His mother's disappointment would be reward enough. Melisande's face swam in front of him, the softness of her mouth. So vulnerable, so sweet, so innocent. The saint of King Street, and here he was debauching her. He shouldn't feel guilty, but he was. It didn't matter. He still wanted that mouth. He wanted so much more. There'd barely been time to do more than touch the possibilities of the flesh. He wanted to do things to her, that had never interested him before. He wanted to cover every inch of her creamy skin with his mouth. He wanted to see if he could make her scream in pleasure. He wanted... He wanted... The brandy bottle slipped from his hand, hitting the Aubusson carpet and rolling toward the fire. He reached out for it, and his balance faltered. The chair went over, and his head smashed against something hard. Might knock some sense into him, he thought dazedly. But maybe he could sleep just a little bit, since he was already lying down. The floor was as good a place as any. He hadn't taken Melisande on the floor, had he? He'd wanted to. Bloody hell. She was still haunting him. He reached out for the brandy bottle, but it had rolled out of his reach, and there was something wet and warm on his head. He reached up a hand to touch it, then brought it down to look at it. Blood. He didn't like blood. In fact, among his other ungentlemanlike transgressions, he couldn't stand the sight of it. And he finally, happily, passed out on the library floor. 28. Miranda Rohan de Merleur, Countess of Rochdale, let out a shriek of dismay, raced into the room and sank down next to the unconscious figure of her oldest brother. There was blood everywhere, and she threw her arms around him, terrified that he was dead. He rewarded her with a loud snore, and she caught the reek of brandy. She sat back on her heels with annoyance, turning to look up at her husband. He's dead drunk, and I think he hit his head. He's bleeding like a pig, the carpet is ruined, and I thought we were here to save Brandon, not Benedict. Lucien de Malheur, the lady's husband, lately referred to as the scorpion for his less than honorable habits, limped into the room, staring down at his brother-in-law. How the mighty have fallen, he murmured softly. My heart, you're getting blood all over that lovely frock. Leave him to me. The Rohans are blessed with very hard heads, and I don't doubt he suffered worse. He's going to be more troubled by his hangover than a little scalp wound. Miranda looked back at her brother, the stalwart she'd always depended on, fear and annoyance fighting for dominance. Are you quite certain? Absolutely. Go find that elderly manservant and see if he can round up a few strong footmen to remove your brother to his bed. 
I doubt we'll need to call a doctor. Even from here, the wound looks superficial, but he'll need a clean-up. Do your brothers tend to cast up their accounts when they've drunk too much? They don't usually drink too much. Something must be very wrong. Benedict usually fixes things. He doesn't give up and drink himself into a stupor. Things must be very bad indeed. Things are never as bad as they seem. And that's why we're here, my love. I received word that the Heavenly Host are holding a gathering in Kent this Saturday, and according to Salfield, the newly reformed organization is a far cry from the harmless activities I remember. Harmless? Miranda said with a screech, her flashing green eyes promising retribution. I seem to remember a very unpleasant evening. Pray don't, Lucian said with a shudder. Haven't I paid for my transgressions sufficiently? No. She blew him a kiss before turning back to her brother. His color was good, his breathing even, and the blood, while horrific in appearance, seemed to have stopped flowing. Her husband was right. Benedict was foxed but perfectly fine. She rose, taking the handkerchief her husband offered and wiping the blood off her hands. You take care of him, and I'll go in search of Brandon. I thought the old man said he had moved out. Richmond, she corrected, and he knows more than that. He always does. You clean up this mess, she cast a withering glance at her favorite big brother, and I'll start working on the other. The brandy had betrayed him completely this time, Benedict thought, in between being violently ill. Not only was Melisande Carstairs still haunting him, but now he had the infernal vision of his despised brother-in-law holding the basin for him. He could think of no worse punishment than imagining the scorpion at hand. But at least, in his still drunken state, he knew perfectly well that his sister and her husband almost never left the Lake District and the bastard would never dare show his scarred, ugly face at Benedict's house. He slept, awoke to cast up his accounts once more, demanded brandy, received none, imagined his brother-in-law conversing with Richmond, the traitor, and then slept again. When he awoke, it was the full light of day, though which day was anybody's guess. His head hurt like the very devil, his stomach was tender, and he felt both raw and sticky. He sat up, slowly, to see that he was in one of the guest rooms. He vaguely remembered the footman trying to get him upstairs, and then having a battle when he refused to be put in his own bed. The servants would have changed the sheets, but they couldn't change his memories. Nothing could sod it. Not bottles of brandy, not smashing his head, nothing. He reached up and felt the matted strands of his hair above the tender lump. Served him right, he thought, and the visions were nothing more than he deserved. Seeing his mortal enemy in his drunken dreams wasn't much better than Melisande's face, but at least it engendered rage, not despair. The door opened, and he stiffened, expecting a disapproving Richmond, come to clean him up and lecture him simply by looking at him. And then he froze. He was no longer drunk, and Lucy and de Malheur were standing inside his bedroom door. He didn't think, didn't hesitate. He launched himself across the room, flattening his brother-in-law, and began pummeling him with enthusiasm. But the scorpion was a strong man, despite his bad leg, and Benedict had the hangover of the century, so it was over quickly. Benedict lay curled up, breathless in pain, as the earl rose to his feet, brushing himself off. You dirty bastard, Benedict gasped. You fight like a street rat. Of course I do, Lucian said calmly. Benedict said nothing trying to catch his breath, and wondering if his plan for an heir was now moot when he was vaguely aware of someone else in the room. What did you do to him? 
came his sister's caustic voice. No less than he deserved. He decided it was time to avenge your honor. Too late, Miranda said cheerfully, leaning down beside him. She smelled of lemon and spice, her familiar scent, and beneath all the misery, fury, and pain, he felt a surge of remembered affection. You shouldn't try to hit Lucy and Benedict. He has no scruples. Benedict coughed. I remember. He was beginning to breathe again, and he decided ignoring Muller was the best thing he could do. For now. What are you doing here, Miranda? Are you well? She placed a hand over her swelling stomach. Perfectly. He stared at her. Good God, are you increasing again? How many children is this, twenty-seven? Another hideous thought struck him. They aren't here, are they? Because while I adore your children, this is hardly the time for a social visit, and there are things going on. This will be my sixth baby, and the other five are back at home with their nanny. This isn't a social visit, darling. Lucy and I are here for a reason, and you're just going to have to swallow your outrage for the time being and put up with us. At that moment he was incapable of moving, but he grunted unencouragingly. The moment he could get to his feet, he was heading straight for the scorpion again. What reason? A sudden fear struck him. Father and mother, are they all right? Perfectly fine, as far as I know, and it's a good thing they're still in Egypt and not here to watch you make such an utter cake of yourself. And that's why you're here? The wheeze had almost gone out of his voice. To make me behave? Hardly. We're come to stop Brandon from destroying his life. You seem to have forgotten his very existence. But Lucian had it from good authority that the heavenly host has... Regathered, yes, I know, Benedict said, managing to sit up. You didn't need to come all the way down here and subject me to your husband's presence in order to tell me that. I have the matter well in hand. Yes, it really seems like it. She sounded skeptical, as only a sister could. And exactly where is Brandon now? Richmond said he moved out a couple of days ago and hasn't been seen since. I'll find him, Benedict snarled his eyes narrowing as he saw Lucian looking at him. The question is, will you find him in time? The scorpion asked in a deliberately civil tone. Or not until he's slaughtered some innocent female and gone beyond any hope of a future. Why should he slaughter an innocent female? Benedict snapped. I'm still presuming those rumors about a virgin sacrifice are highly embroidered even though I've promised to check them out. I never thought you so gullible that you'd come herring down all the way from the Lake District. They aren't rumors, Neddy, Miranda said in a quiet voice. Lucian knows people. His sources are unimpeachable. They're planning some hideous ritual on the night of the full moon involving an innocent girl, and our brother has been chosen to wield the knife and apparently he's so far lost to drink and opium that there's no common sense left to stop him. Why would he be chosen? Benedict demanded. No one has any idea who's in charge, who chose him, or why, Lucien said. But my sources are never wrong. If we don't find Brandon before tomorrow night, it will be too late. We haven't the faintest idea where they're planning to meet, and— that's where you're wrong. I know exactly where they're meeting, and if we haven't found Brandon before then, I suppose I can go and stop them myself. He got to his feet, albeit a little shakily. His hangover and the recent sucker punch still left him reeling. He glanced at Malheur, wondering if he dared go for him again. But Miranda was in the way, and he expected she'd make certain to keep between them from now on. He'd have to wait to wipe the smirk off that toad-sucking son of a bitch. 
And if we do find Brandon? Are you going to stand by and let some poor innocent be murdered? His sister demanded. For all like the woman he'd just sent from his life. Why did they all have to be so damned emotional? All sorts of poor innocents get murdered every day, Miranda. I can hardly be responsible for them, he drawled. You can if you know about them. Her fine eye narrowed. What's happened to you, Neddy? Fallen in love, he thought morosely. And then froze. Where had those words come from? At least he hadn't said them out loud. He only had himself to chastise. I'm a practical man, he said instead. He looked away. For some reason, the disappointment in Miranda's eyes was too painful. He was becoming adept at disappointing women, he thought sourly. Perhaps he deserved a cold-blooded bitch like Dorothea Pennington after all. Miss Dorothea Pennington has arrived to see you, Richmond announced from the doorway, like a voice from the grave. It had to be some bloody sign. He shoved his hair away from his face, wincing as his hand bounced against his head wound. Tell her I'll join her directly. Dorothea Pennington, Miranda said, aghast. What in the world has that mean-hearted piece of work got to do with anything? I thought you were... were involved with Lady Carstairs. He wanted to whirl around and snap like an angry cur, but he kept his temper in check, saying the one thing he knew would horrify her. Your sources are nowhere near as reliable as you seem to think. I intend to marry Miss Pennington, of course. 29. By the time he'd managed a hasty wash and changed his ruined clothes, Benedict had kept Miss Pennington waiting a goodly amount of time. Miranda had flatly refused to entertain her while he made himself halfway presentable, so he'd sent Richmond in with sugar cakes and tea while he stripped, washed, changed, and took one horrified look at himself in the mirror. The cut above his eyebrow was absurdly small to have caused so much blood, and it did little to distract from his bloodshot eyes and the circles beneath them. He needed to be shaved as well, but there was hardly enough time to manage that. Richmond usually did the honours, and if he attempted it himself, he'd probably cut his throat. Which, in retrospect, wouldn't be a bad thing. Well, if they were to be married, she'd be seeing him unshaven, across the sheets of the marriage bed. He shuddered instinctively, and paused outside the door to the blue salon. He shouldn't have had Richmond put her in there. He'd spent too much time with Charity Carstairs in that room. Though, presumably, he'd be sharing his bedroom, his bed with Miss Pennington. The same room and bed he'd shared with Melisande. If anything would lay her ghost, it would be Dorothea's pinched face. Straightening himself, he opened the door. Miss Pennington was sitting by the fire, ramrod straight, her gloved hands folded perfectly in her lap, her face set in impatient lines. It was a handsome face, he realized with surprise. Good bones, clear skin, symmetrical, with wide-set eyes and a cupid's bow of a mouth. If she were a little softer, she might have been considered a beauty. Perhaps he could soften her. She turned to look at him, rising, and there was disapproval in those flinty eyes. You hardly look ready to receive guests, Rohan, she observed. Indeed, I must ask your pardon. I decided I had kept you waiting for too long and hoped you would forgive me my déchaville. She didn't look like she was about to forgive anything, but then she smiled mechanically. Of course, dear sir. She sank back down, allowing him to take the chair he so badly needed. And to what do I owe the extreme and unexpected honour of your visit, Miss Pennington? He had no idea whether it was his hangover or the blow on his head, but he could fathom no reason at all why she'd be here. 
It's dreadfully forward of me, I know, but I hadn't seen you in a while, and I was concerned. I wanted to assure myself that you were quite well. He hoped the hunted feeling didn't show on his face. She was like a prize spaniel in search of its prey. Except that he liked spaniels. Quite well, Miss Pennington. I beg your pardon. I've been dealing with a pressing family matter. He glanced around, desperate to change the topic. But you haven't touched your tea. Allow me to ring for fresh— No, thank you, Rohan. I have a strong dislike of sweets and consider afternoon tea to be a weakness of the Constitution. He couldn't help it. The plate was piled high with the sweet cakes that Melisande adored. Left alone with them, she probably wouldn't have left a crumb. There was something so reassuring about a woman with an honest appetite. He wiped the thought from his mind. Dorothea Pennington wasn't improving his headache, and the sooner she departed, the better. So true, he said vaguely, knowing he would give his right arm for a cup of even lukewarm tea. And how may I assist you, Miss Pennington? Her posture was so rigidly correct that he would have said it impossible, but she seemed to draw herself up even more. May I be frank, Lord Rohan? I wish you would, my dear Miss Pennington. I think we should be married. It was a good thing he wasn't drinking tea. He would have choked. As it was, he kept his expression schooled, shielding his shock. I beg your pardon? Yes, I know it's completely forward of me, but you and I are mature people, and you have already shown a marked partiality toward me. Several people have noted it, and I am certain you would never have paid such particular attention without meaning to follow through. You are, above all things, a gentleman, and I know I can count on you to behave as you ought. You would never bring me a moment's shame, and your title, though connected to a name that is ramshackle in the extreme, is high enough that a Pennington would not blush to be connected. My family goes back to William the Conqueror, and we may look as high as we please when it comes to marriage, but I think you and I should suit extremely. I would like to get married in the fall, and it takes a great deal of time to arrange a marriage on the magnitude that would befit a Pennington, and I really cannot afford to be patient any longer. I decided it would make things a great deal simpler if I took the bull by the horns, so to speak. He assumed he didn't look as aghast as he felt. Very thorough, and very direct, Miss Pennington. I appreciate your forthright attitude. I imagined you would. A self-satisfied smile curved her small mouth. He didn't trust a woman with a small mouth. Melisande's was wide and generous. I thought St. Paul's would be the logical choice for the ceremony. Westminster Abbey is inconveniently located. She made it sound like a personal affront. And we would have to wait until next spring for a proper date. You've already checked, he said faintly. I am a thorough woman. I presume you will leave these petty details to me. I am more than capable of dealing with them. I am sure you are, he said. He could stand it no longer. He reached for the teapot. Cold tea was better than none, but Miss Pennington, eyeing him with disapproval, took the teapot from his hand. If you feel in need of a reviving beverage, I will ring for fresh water. Your servants are not what I would call remarkable. The old man who brought me in here is far past the age of usefulness. He should be replaced with someone younger. That would quite break Richmond's heart. She looked at him for the first time honestly confused. Is there any particular reason why his feelings should be considered in this matter? One needs to be practical about such things. Indeed, he said slowly. She didn't ring for fresh water, and he knew there was no way he was going to be able to pour himself tea without her wresting the pot from him once more. He settled back to suffer in silence.
I am glad we're agreed upon that. A trace of smugness now tinged her small mouth. Melisande hadn't liked her, he recalled. In fact, she'd referred to the woman as a mean-spirited piece of work. Unfortunately apt. While we're on the subject, the mean-spirited piece of work continued, we should come to an understanding on other matters. I would expect to run my household with no interference from you. I have been trained my entire life to run a gentleman's estate, and the size of yours should offer no challenge at all. Thus, with a few words, she dismissed his admittedly impressive estates and inheritance. We would, of course, expect to have children, and I would scarce deny you the marriage bed, but you have a certain reputation for... lasciviousness. No gentleman would ever insult his wife by making her suffer such lewd attentions, but I wanted to make it clear from the outset that I will countenance no displays of lustfulness. We will come together in the hope of being fruitful. I rather thought three children, any more and it hints of ill manners. An heir and a spare for you, and a daughter I can raise and mould in my own image. Christ, he thought, aghast. Two Dorothy Penningtons in this world beggared description. Two in his own family was insupportable. One cannot always control the sex of one's offspring, he ventured. She frowned at him. The word gender is more genteel. You will find I am a very forward-thinking woman, my dear Rohan. Our country is headed for a correction, a move into more circumspect times, where language will be tempered and behavior will be just as it ought. The ramshackle times of our fathers is past. More's the pity, he thought. He schooled his expression into one of polite interest. And did you have any other thoughts about our future together? Of course. He half expected her to whip out a list, but apparently she'd memorized it. This house is too small for a proper town residence. It does fine for a bachelor, but would scarcely do for entertaining, and I am not fond of the address. I thought a house in the vicinity of Grosvenor Square might be nice. Indeed, he said noncommittally. He loved his house. I have yet to inspect your country estates, but since we won't be spending much time in either one of them, I doubt it matters. I'm a city woman, dear Rohan. I dislike the country in all forms of sports. I do hope you don't hunt. I do occasionally, he admitted, though he had his own misgivings about the sport. You will cease. And another thing. I suppose I should handle this delicately, but I believe in facing things with no roundaboutation, and we may as well start out as we mean to go on. Indeed, he said politely. Your family. She concealed a delicate shudder, but just barely. I've realized we must certainly continue an association with your parents, and while your father's past is reprehensible, your mother appears to be beyond reproach, and she has provided a civilizing effect, just as I expect to do with you. He was a far cry from the wild young Lord Adrian Rohan in his heyday, but he decided that silence was best at this juncture. He simply bowed his head in seeming acquiescence. However, the rest of your family is another matter. While I have no quarrel with your brother Charles and his unexceptional wife, your other siblings have proven themselves to be, shall we say, undesirable company. Shall we say, take a damper, Benedict thought, with a certain amount of savagery. He plastered a smile on his face. Indeed, he said in an encouraging tone. We both know your sister has proven herself beyond the pale more than once, she continued. She was ruined, and yet, instead of retiring to the country and living out her life in genteel obscurity, she chose to stay in London, her very presence an affront to decent women. And then, to marry that awful man who is no more than a... a criminal. At least she has the sense to keep out of London. 
I gather she drops babies like a peasant. We shall need to cut that connection entirely. You would hardly expect me to acknowledge her socially. I have my own reputation to consider. And you think it isn't strong enough to withstand association with my sister? I wonder you even considered my suit in the first place, he said evenly. I did think long and hard on it, Miss Pennington admitted frankly. But I knew you abhorred your sister's choices as much as I did, and would be more than happy to cut the connection. And my brother Brandon? She made a face, as if she'd tasted something unpleasant. Indeed. I gather he's been in town, though thankfully he's kept out of the public eye. It's a very difficult situation. I know the poor boy has suffered dreadfully for his country, but we really can't expect our guests to have to look at his disfigurements and still manage to have a pleasant evening. We can entertain him when we're in the countryside, of course, as long as we have no house guests and our children are kept in the nursery. But you must understand my hesitation. I prefer to be surrounded by beauty. He wondered what would happen if he took the teapot and dumped its contents on her head. I understand you completely. Then we're agreed, she said, too well bred to sound too overtly smug. I would like a ring to signify our betrothal. Something discreet, valuable, but not too flashy. I've chosen one at my jeweler's. I'll give you the direction and you may pick it up tomorrow. You're very thorough, but I'm afraid I'll be busy tomorrow. I have to go into the country. Not that wretched house party that my brother is attending. I'm not sure I approve. I think in the future you should use your influence to help my brother get a post in the government. Nothing that requires real labor, more a social nicety. You can do that, can't you? I can, he said. Where I would or not is a different matter. Then you may fetch the ring next week. I've had my secretary draw up an announcement, and she will send it to the papers as soon as I return home. Christ's blood, he thought in horror. He had to move fast, or he'd find himself leg-shackled to his worst nightmare. She'd give him children. She'd leave him alone. He would never care about her. Exactly what he'd been so sure he wanted. Now he wanted to drown her in the Thames. She was already preparing to leave. She rose, casting her gimlet gaze his way. You may kiss me, my dear Rohan. He'd rather kiss a charging boar. One moment, Miss Pennington, he said politely, heading for the door, prepared to send Richmond on a hunt. It was easier than he expected. Richmond and his sister were hovering by the door, clearly eavesdropping, and the scorpion lounged nearby on one of the love seats in the hallway. Miranda's expression was a cross between amusement and doubt, and he felt a moment's shame. She really thought it was possible that he might repudiate her for someone like Dorothea Pennington. Well, my dear, he said to her, are you prepared to meet my fiancé? Her expression was stricken. I gather she doesn't wish to meet me. Nothing good comes to those who eavesdrop, usually. He swung open the door and ushered his sister's very pregnant form inside, leaving the door open for his brother-in-law and Richmond to observe. Miss Pennington's face had frozen making her look like a startled hake. Miss Pennington, Benedict said smoothly, I don't believe you're acquainted with my sister, Lady Rochdale. She is quite my favorite sibling, even if I haven't always cared for her choices, and when I marry again I would want her as one of the bride's attendants. Mind you, she'll most likely be in some stage of pregnancy, given her alarming level of fecundity, but dressmakers know how to adjust for such exigencies. Her husband, of course, will be one of my attendants, though I expect my baby brother Brandon will stand up with me as well. We've always been very close. 
Miss Pennington's mouth opened and closed without a word issuing forth, and Benedict continued on. Of course, Brandon is currently dealing with an unpleasant addiction to opium and alcohol, but I imagine we'll be able to prop him up long enough to get through the ceremony. Your own brother has been keeping company with the heavenly host, so I doubt his behavior has been much better, but the two of them can keep each other company, can they not? He heard Miranda's gurgle of laughter from beside him, and he realized how much he had missed that sound. Missed his sister. So much that he'd stomached the scorpion to have her back in his life. Miss Pennington was glaring. You insult me, sir. If you think I don't know that my brother has been disporting himself with those gentlemen, then you think I'm a great deal stupider than I am. There's a difference. Their activities are held in secret, among their own class, and the only ones who are hurt are whores and peasants. Peasants, Miss Pennington? That seems an oddly archaic term. Do you still keep serfs on your estates in Cumberland? Oh, but I forgot. Your father lost all the family estates years ago, leaving you forced to marry for money. Though why in heaven's name you thought I'd be a suitable choice astounds me. I assumed you were a man who shared my values and opinions, she said tightly. Apparently I was quite deluded in my opinion. Quite, thank God, Miranda broke in. Dorothea Pennington refused to even acknowledge her. I'm afraid, sir, that the engagement is off. I'm afraid, my dear Miss Pennington, that the engagement was never on. You are the very last woman I would consider marrying. He could almost imagine smoke coming out of those perfect shell-like ears. No decent woman would have you, she hissed. Now that's where you're wrong. You may expect a happy announcement from me quite soon. He wasn't quite sure why he said it. It seemed to spring into his mouth from nowhere. Do not bother to send me an invitation. Her voice was frosty. He won't, his cursed interfering sister volunteered. I don't believe Lady Carstairs would want you anywhere near her. He jerked to look down at her in astonishment when Miss Pennington let out an outraged shriek. Lady Carstairs, she cried. Charity Carstairs? You're marrying her? Why, she must be thirty years old. Damn his sister. He should drown her in the Thames as well. I have yet to ask her, he temporized. But she'll say yes, Miranda jumped in, because they're in love. You don't know the meaning of the word, Dorothea Pennington, and you never will. Now go away, do. We have a wedding to arrange. If the exquisitely well-behaved Dorothea Pennington had something near at hand, she would have thrown it, Benedict decided, horror and amusement warring for control. He watched her stalk from the room, and he could tell from her horrified shriek when she clapped eyes on his scarred brother-in-law, lazily stretched out in the hall. They waited until they heard the front door slam, and then he turned to Miranda. What the hell did you mean, I'm marrying Melisande? he demanded in a choked voice. I most certainly am not. Her smile broadened. I know you better than you think, Neddy. Stop fighting it. You want her, whether it's practical or not. You should have her. We don't suit, he said stiffly. Besides, she despises me. Well, that's always a good sign. But we can deal with your love life later, once we found Brandon. Any idea where he might have gone? He gave up then. His head ached too much to deal with all of this, and Dorothea Pennington would hardly be likely to spread rumors of her former suitor's engagement. It would reflect too badly on her. He would have a few days to sort things out. Brandon, he agreed, heading toward the open door. Lucien de Molleur was still there, an ironic expression on his face. He tensed when he saw Benedict, as if expecting another assault. 
I'm not going to kill you now, Benedict said. We need to fetch Brandon. You're not going to kill me ever, Lucian said lazily, getting to his feet, his gold-headed cane in one strong hand. Lead on, Macduff. 30. It started as a soft scratching on her bedroom door, the one Melisande had locked before she'd collapsed into bed. That much she could ignore. It was morning, and she'd just gone to bed, and it simply wasn't fair to try to wake her. She put the pillow over her head as the scratching went to a soft knock. Open the door, Melisande. Emma's soft voice came from the other side. I need to talk to you. She didn't need to talk with anyone. Emma would know full well that she hadn't returned home last night, and she would know where she'd been and what she'd been doing. And that was absolutely the last thing Melisande had any intention of discussing. The knocking grew louder, penetrating the layers of feathers and laudanum-induced fog, and Melisande rolled over, cursing. From the angle of the sun, she could tell it was early morning, not much past six. She hadn't closed her curtain, but the overcast sun was still an annoyance. Why should anyone expect her to wake up at such an ungodly hour when she'd been out all night and— and not returned home until after nine in the morning? She'd slept the day and night away, wrapped in misery and laudanum, and they were one day closer to the solstice. Bloody hell! Emma was pounding by now, and the wood door was shaking in its frame. Melisande sat up, groaning, and climbed out of bed. She was vaguely aware that her ankle wasn't bothering her as she limped toward the door, vaguely aware that muscles she hadn't known she had were protesting, and she wasn't going to examine that thought too closely. By the time she opened the door, Emma was using both fists, and one look at her expression and Melisande's bruised heart sank. Something was very wrong indeed. She looked past Emma to the gaggle, all in various states of undress, watching them. When did you last see Betsy? Emma demanded breathlessly. This morning, Melisande replied immediately, confused. Oh, thank God. At least I think so, she added. What day is it? Friday? Emma's relief vanished. It's Saturday. You've slept the clock around. Do you mean you haven't seen Betsy since yesterday morning? Where was she? In the library. We talked for a bit. She was missing Eileen and worried about the future. I told her she could stay here as long as she wanted, and then she went down to visit Cook. Did you ask Molly Biscuits? Of course I did. Panic was shredding Emma's usual calm. She said Betsy came in, helped her with the bread, then took some pasties and said she was going to eat them out in the sun. Molly thinks she was heading for St. Jim's Park, but we can't be certain. She might have walked farther ahead to Green Park, or even all the way to Hyde Park. And she never came back. No tea, no supper, and her bed hasn't been slept in. She wouldn't have run away, Melisande said flatly trying to force her brain into full working mode despite the lingering effect of the damned laudanum. Of course not, which means only one thing. The gaggle were listening avidly, but they were all women of the world, and knew the answer as well as she did. It means she was taken. No. Molly Biscuits let out a cry, tears running down her plump cheeks. Not that poor wee child. It's the heavenly host, Violet piped up helpfully, causing the rest of the gaggle to start talking so loudly that Melisande could barely think. Enough, Emma cried, temporarily shutting them up while doing absolutely nothing for Melisande's headache. If they've taken her, and there's no guarantee that they did, then Lady Carstairs can get her back. She's been working very hard this week, and Viscount Rohan has been assisting her. Cook, bring us a pot of strong tea and some of those little cakes you've been experimenting with. 
Violet, you take the others and go out looking. It's always possible that Betsy simply got lost and found an alley to sleep in. She had to do it often enough when she was younger, poor thing. Yes, Mrs. Cadbury, Violet said importantly. And Lord knows she's at a good age. Too old for the gents who like the young ones, yet not old enough for those who like a bit of meat with their brisket. She plumped a full breast with one hand. What does that even mean? Long Jane beside her demanded. It means she's got a good chance of being safe enough, Suki said. God willing. Suki's tenure with the bishop had left some of his piety intact. There were a few added God willings from the more religious of the gaggle as they slowly started to disperse, and Emma took Melisande's arm, hurrying her back into her bedroom. I'll help you dress she said briskly. We haven't any time to waste. She paused enough to look at her. I wish we had time to talk about your night with Rohan, but Betsy's been gone for far too long, and we can't afford to waste any more time. Nothing happened, Melisande said stoutly. God give me strength, Emma muttered, pulling the robe off her shoulders. Of course it did. You just don't want to talk about it which I assume means he either botched the job or you didn't like it. Whichever it was, we can deal with it later. There's nothing to be dealt with. I told you, nothing happened. She let Emma hand her into one of her narrow walking dresses, then began fastening the long row of buttons up the front. Then why is your body adorned with such interesting signs, may I ask you? Clearly my Lord Rohan likes to mark his partners, though that must be something new. Unusual for someone who prides himself on his self-control. Melisande touched her breast instinctively, then snatched her hand away. I don't know what you're talking about. I fell. Of course you did. And the bruise just happens to be the size and shape of a mouth. I didn't see teeth marks, which is a good thing. The ones who leave teeth marks can be a little strange. For a moment, the memory, almost physical, of Benedict biting down on her earlobe as her arousal built, hit her like a blow. Don't we have something more important to discuss? Has anyone been seen loitering around here? Half of London knows the women live here, but Betsy is the only innocent. It makes no sense that anyone would be searching for a virgin here, unless Eileen was forced to tell them. I don't know, Emma said bleakly, but I have a very bad feeling about this. Do you want me to have a note delivered to Viscount Rohan, or will you go there directly? As if things weren't desperate enough. She ducked her head so that Emma wouldn't see the absolute horror that suffused her face. She would go nowhere near Benedict Rohan ever again. He had made his disdain for her perfectly clear. Which meant she had to find Betsy on her own. Had the girls finished with the monk's robe they were making? It's in your closet. Does that mean you think the heavenly host really did take her? They need a virgin for tomorrow. Tonight. How and why they knew is beyond me. Maybe Rohan had betrayed her and told them in order to rescue his brother. Anything was possible. I cannot risk losing her. I must go, even if I'm wrong. And you know where they're meeting? You and the Viscount? We do, she said, sticking to the absolute letter of the truth. I'm not going to let anything happen to Betsy. She strode to the wardrobe, caught the dull brown robe in one hand, and started limping toward the door. You can't go out with that bad ankle, Emma said belatedly. Let me send a message. No, on no account are you to correspond with Viscount Rohan. The panic was seeping into her voice, but she averted her face on the off chance Emma wouldn't notice. She was usually far too observant, but her worry over Betsy was bound to distract her. Just leave it up to me. I wouldn't want a letter to get into the wrong hands. We certainly don't want his brother to know we're so close. An odd expression crossed Emma's face. 
Are you certain his brother is tied up with those deviants? Absolutely. According to Benedict, uh, Viscount Rohan, his brother is equally fond of the opium pipe and excesses of alcohol. It's little wonder. He was grievously wounded in the Afghan wars, and he's yet to recover. She looked Emma directly in the eyes, unblinking, and flat out lied to her. I'll go there directly and we'll decide what to do next. You may rely on me. I'll bring Betsy back. If it kills me, she thought. If Emma thought she was with Rohan, she wouldn't worry, and it would give her more time to accomplish what she had to do. She made her way slowly down the two flights of stairs, breathing a sigh of relief that her ankle had definitely improved. By the time she reached the ground floor, a hired carriage had been brought round, the gaggle had dispersed in what Melisande knew was a fruitless search for Betsy, and Emma was watching her with a doubtful expression on her face. I hate to send you out alone, she said, but I can't very well accompany you, and Miss Mackenzie is too elderly to be of any assistance. If it weren't for Viscount Rohan, I would feel very grave doubts about letting you go. Melisande plastered a totally believable smile on her face. I'll be perfectly fine, I promise you. We've got this well in hand. And what if you're wrong? Emma trailed after her. What if Betsy turns up, none the worse for wear? How can I get in touch with you? If Betsy is safe, then so much the better. But it still means that some other innocent is in danger. Even if it's a stranger, I can hardly turn my back on her. She needed to get out of there before Emma asked one too many questions and realized she had no intention of going to Rohan at all, before she looked too closely into Melisande's deliberately limpid gaze. Of course, but still... I need to go, Emma. Remember your promise. It would do no good to be in touch with Viscount Rohan. He'll be out of town with me. I promise I'll be back as soon as I can, once I'm assured that the Heavenly Host won't be enacting any cruel rituals. There's something you're not telling me, Emma said sharply. I don't have time to tell you everything, Melisande cried. I'll explain it all when I get back, but right now there's no time to waste. She finally managed to escape, limping down the front steps to the small carriage awaiting her. Emma had helped her down, giving Rohan's Berry Street address to the driver, and Melisande had no choice but to sit on the edge of the seat until he turned the corner before knocking at the small hatch. Yes, milady, the driver inquired. I'm afraid my friend had the wrong address. I require you to drive me out of town, to the village of Cursley Mill. It's only a few hours from London, and you'll be well compensated. Her reticule was stuffed with every bit of money the household had boasted, and it should be enough to put the coachman up for the night at the local inn if that was what he preferred. Yes, milady, he said, and she sat back, breathing a sigh of relief. One hurdle, no, a great many hurdles had been leaped. The rest was up to her. She only felt a moment's guilt at misleading Emma into thinking she'd gone to Rohan for help. He'd made it abundantly clear that his only interest in all this was in rescuing his brother. If she wanted to guarantee Betsy's safety, she was on her own. It had nothing to do with the fact that the very idea of facing Benedict Rohan ever again made her want to curl up into a ball and weep. She was a stronger woman than that. She didn't need anyone to help her, particularly not a grudging, cynical, scum-sucking, pig-swiving sack of awful like Benedict Rohan. The two hours it took her to get to Cursley Mill was more than enough to gird her loins. It was still early in the day, given Melisande's crack of dawn start, and while the driver was loath to drop her off in what seemed like the middle of nowhere, the purse she thrust on him more than made up for any misgivings. It was a warm afternoon, though the day was overcast, and she waited until the coach was out of sight before she found a copse of trees and proceeded to don the monk's robes. 
Unfortunately, her petticoats were too full, and she had no choice but to reach under her skirts and untie the tapes that held them. By the time she slid out of all three of them, the dull monk's robe sat a little closer to her body, though she wasn't sure it would pass close inspection. The trick, then, was not to let anyone get too close. According to Rohan's idle conversation on their last trip to Kersley Hall, the original Heavenly Host allowed for certain members to attend ceremonies merely as watchers. If they wore a monk's robe and had a white ribbon around their arm, then they were allowed to pass among the assembled celebrants with a vow of silence, and no one conversed with them nor expected them to partake of the depraved activities. She hadn't bothered to she hadn't bothered to she hadn't bothered to she hadn't bothered to us 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 how he knew of this particular variation he'd assured her it had been the case some forty years ago and considering he hadn't been born back then, she took leave to doubt the veracity of that notion. But she had no choice. She could hardly mingle as charity cast as, do-gooder and semi-virgin. The only way she was going to find Betsy was if she went in disguised. She'd overestimated the improvement in her ankle. By the time the ruins of Kersley Hall came into sight, she was moving very slowly indeed and she could only hope she wouldn't be called on to run for it. She'd be in big trouble if she was. She'd almost waited too long. It was Saturday. Tomorrow was the night of the full moon, the night of virgin sacrifice that Melisande suspected had absolutely nothing to do with the old pagan religions and everything to do with the twisted mentality of the human involved in this degenerate organization. The gloomy ruins of Kersley Hall looked as abandoned as they had a few days ago, when she and Rohan had ridden there. Of course, they'd run into two of the members that time, even though there'd been no sign of them. So there was no guarantee the place was deserted this time, either. She could see the area where the tunnels had collapsed and they'd fallen through. The collapse could have been caused by the heavy spring rains just as easily as trespassing humans, and she could only hope the members, who'd already found it, had attributed it to natural causes. Otherwise, there was always the devastating possibility that they'd changed their location. Pulling the cowl up around her head, she moved forward, trying to disguise her limp. She was usually acutely aware when someone was watching her, and thankfully that feeling was absent. But it didn't hurt to be as circumspect as possible. There was no way she was going to slide back down into the collapsed tunnel. Her only way back into the caves was through the abandoned dairy. She moved carefully, holding her breath as she came up behind the building and peered in the smoke-stained windows. No sign of anyone. Her heart was hammering, her palms were sweating, and she wanted to turn back. But running from Benedict Rohan was one thing. That was no one's business but her own. There was no way she could run from someone in need, no matter how dangerous the situation. She moved around the front of the building, pushed open the latch, and stepped inside. Even in the brightness of the midday sun, the room was dark and shadowed and it took a moment for her eyes to adjust. She started for the doors leading down to the tunnels, and then stopped. The door was barred and locked, an ancient padlock the size of a platter holding an equally heavy chain in place. There was no way she was getting past that. Which meant she had no choice but to see whether she could climb back in using the cave-in, this time without landing on her ankle. Of course, the first time she'd had a full-grown male end up on top of her, which hadn't improved matters. And she wasn't going to think about Benedict Rohan being on top of her any more. That didn't help matters either. She had just reached the door when she heard a noise overhead, 
a scuffling sound, louder than even the largest rats could make, and she froze, her hair standing on end. If it were any of the heavenly host, they would hardly be hiding, she thought, forcing herself to calm down. There were stairs at the back of the room, and before she could cry off, she started up them, as quietly as she could, so as not to alert anyone who might be up there. The hallway was dark and deserted, with a doorway on either side, both doors closed and locked. Light was coming through the door on the left, as if there was a window, and she tiptoed toward it, flinching every time a floorboard creaked. The door had a barred window in it, with no glass, and she stood on her tiptoes, her ankles screaming in protest. At first, she could see nothing inside, just a cot, a table and chair, and a bundle of rags. But slowly that bundle of rags began to look familiar, the blue serge that all of her gaggle wore. Betsy, she whispered urgently, is that you? The bundle stirred, very slowly, and then resolved itself into the familiar figure of a young girl. Miss, she said anxiously, her young voice raspy. It's me, Betsy. Are you all right? Betsy scrambled to her feet, running over to the door. Oh, miss, you shouldn't be here. They've locked me in and there's no way out and they're very bad men. You should leave. Melisande rattled the door in frustration. What about the windows? If I were able to find you a rope, could you climb down? She shook her head. She was filthy, straw in her hair, dirt and what looked like a bruise across her young face. There are bars on the windows. Melisande cursed, and Betsy looked impressed. She looked around her, but the hallway was empty of everything, and she hadn't even thought to bring the small lady's pistol she carried with her when she travelled in the more dangerous areas of London. What an idiot she'd been! I'm going to need to find something to break the lock, Betsy. Just be patient. I'm not walking too well. I hate to leave you locked in here even for another moment, but I'll try to hurry. I'll be fine, miss. I've been here one night already, and they bring me food and leave me alone. Do you have any idea of why they want me? I ain't pretty like the others, and I'm too old for those that likes the little ones. Melisande didn't bother to ask her how she knew of such foul practices. After all, the child had lived on the streets for years, just barely managing to maintain her innocence. There would be few things she hadn't seen or heard. But she wouldn't have heard of girls being murdered in a ritual sacrifice, and Melisande wasn't about to enlighten her. I don't know, she said, but it doesn't matter. I'll be back as soon as I can with help, and we'll get you away from here, safely back home. An odd expression crossed Betsy's face. I don't think so, miss, she said in a hollow voice. You don't? But why not? she demanded, puzzled. The sudden darkness that descended answered all her questions. 31. The house on Barry Street existed in what could best be called an armed truce. While Benedict would have liked nothing better than to kick his wretched brother-in-law to the street, that would involve losing his sister as well, and he wasn't in any particular mood to pass judgment on anyone or to drive another female from his life. For the time being, there wasn't anything particular that he could do. His brother-in-law had connections in the London underworld, and right now their criminal minions were out and about, scouring the city for any sign of Brandon, and it stood to reason that they would have far more success than he would. Miranda had taken over his library, and was even now making long lists. He was wise enough, or cowardly enough, not to ask why. He had the dreadful suspicion she was already planning his forthcoming nuptials, and he didn't know how to tell her that Melisande Carstairs wouldn't have him if he were the last man on earth. 
she'd ask him why, and he certainly couldn't tell her, which left him with nothing to do for the next few hours but try to recover from his hangover. Soaking in a hot bath for half an hour helped. Opening all the windows in his bedroom and letting the warm spring air rush in was even better. He considered seeing if another tot of brandy might finish the job, but his stomach rebelled at the very thought, which left him, clean and shaved and dreadfully sober, to face the future. He wasn't marrying her. Even if she'd have him, which she certainly wouldn't, he had no intention of leg-shackling himself to such a difficult woman. She'd always be racing off to save some new stray lamb, and if she even caught wind of the Scorpion's criminal associations, she'd probably try to save them as well. She was a dangerous woman, never content with the status quo, and she would drag whoever was fool enough to marry her along for the ride. Mind you, she was quite exquisite when she wasn't on a tirade. She had the softest mouth, the creamiest skin, the loveliest breasts that beaded perfectly beneath his hungry mouth. He could still hear the sound she made when he first thrust inside her, and the other squeaks and murmurs and cries when she climaxed. He could feel the heat of her body beneath him, her arms around his neck, her legs around his hips, pulling him into her. He could close his eyes and remember the weight of her on top of him, head thrown back in mindless delight. He needed a woman. He needed sex. It didn't matter with whom. For some reason, he'd been unable to summon up even the slightest bit of interest in anyone else ever since he first ran afoul of Charity Carstairs. Now that he'd effectively driven her away for good, he should be able to find a suitable bed partner quite easily. Except, when he went over possibilities in his mind, he found he dismissed each one. None of them suited. None of them aroused him in the slightest. Not even Violet High Street's most sophisticated talents could fill him with even the slightest trace of longing. Thinking of Melisande Carstairs's soft mouth, however, coaxing her to take him, they hadn't gotten to that particular delight. Now they never would. His sister walked in without knocking, and he slammed a book over his loins to hide himself from her curious eyes. People do knock, you know, he said coldly. I knew you were dressed. Besides, I'm not people. I'm your sister. More's the pity. Miranda plopped herself down on the bed, her noticeably pregnant belly making the move cumbersome but still graceful. How do you manage with that thing? he demanded, fascinated. You get used to it she said with a grin. Don't you remember with Annis? With Lady Barbara? His momentary curiosity vanished. I prefer not to dwell on those times in my life. Considering that both times the pregnancy led to the death of my wife, I can hardly consider the memories to be cheerful ones. If she'd showed pity, he would have thrown something. Instead, she was practical. Pregnancy is always a difficult prospect. Some women aren't strong enough for it. Clearly, I have the constitution of a broodmare. Even broodmares have a high incidence of birth-related mortality, he said gloomily. I raise horses on the side, remember? All right, then. Think of me as a milk cow. I can drop my carbs in the field and keep on munching grass. So can a great many others. Most women, in fact. Just because you had abominable luck doesn't mean you shouldn't try again. In case you haven't heard, I have every intention of remarrying and providing an heir. That was why I made the mistake of considering Dorothy a Pennington. God help us all, Miranda said with a shudder. And that is why I would never consider Melisande Carstairs. Melisande, Miranda said, diverted. What a pretty name. He snarled. She's thirty years old, he said. 
She was married ten years without giving birth, so presumably she's barren. Miranda sat on the bed, watching him out of eyes that saw too clearly, knew him too well. Finally she spoke. Then I don't see what you're so damn terrified of. If she can't get pregnant, she can't die, and you don't have to worry about losing her. It's all right to love her. But I... His voice trailed off as her words sank in. Melisande wouldn't die. It didn't matter if he made the mistake of loving her. She was barren. The rigors of childbirth wouldn't rip her away. He looked into Miranda's sympathetic eyes. You think you know me so well, he said sourly. I do. I've known you all my life. You try to pretend you don't care about things, but inside you're like a nice warm bowl of porridge. He looked at her with profound dislike. Your pregnancy won't keep me from kicking you out on the street if you continue with such asinine similes. She didn't look worried. Lucian will let us know the moment he gets word. I think you need to tell me about her. Why wouldn't she have you if you were the last man on earth? The damnable thing about erections was that it took forever for them to subside, even when faced with the most daunting of circumstances, and he couldn't very well get up and walk away without embarrassing them both. No, that was probably not true. Nothing could embarrass his wretched younger sister. She has no particular need for men. In fact, she had decided to live a life of celibacy, devoted to good works. Miranda shuddered. She doesn't sound much better than Dorothea. What is this current mania of yours for joyless women? She's not a joyless woman, he snarled. She just doesn't see the need for the opposite sex. Her life was carefully arranged, her efforts going toward rescuing fallen women in soiled doves, and it gave her satisfaction and, yes, joy. And you changed her mind? He looked away. I was a damnable fool. Though I must say in my defense that it wasn't strictly my fault. She wanted my assistance in stopping the heavenly host, and she knew that Brandon was a part of them. Then I like her already. So what happened next? We made discoveries. We found they were meeting at Kersley Hall, and we discovered several of the current membership, though we still have no idea who their mysterious leader is, the one who's pushing everyone in such a sordid direction. That's something good, at least. So what went wrong? There was no way in hell he was going to tell her. None of your business! Did you seduce her? She looked at him closely. Of course you did. Oh, Benedict, how could you be so cruel? If the woman really wanted nothing to do with getting married again, you should have let her be. Unless you really have fallen desperately in love with her. I most certainly have not, and I certainly didn't intend. That is, I wasn't going to— He floundered then stopped, glaring at her. I'm not going to discuss this with you. You botched it? I'm astonished. I used to hear the maids and the local girls whispering about you, and you were accounted to be a most accomplished lover. Annis used to tell me you— Oh, God, he said weakly. This is completely inappropriate. When have I ever been appropriate? She grinned. So you botched the job, she ran away screaming in horror, and you're not brave enough to try again. Have I got that right? As usual, you're completely wrong. I didn't, as you so delicately put it, botch the job. I was, however, less than... less than kind the next morning. The relationship is quite impossible, and I managed to make that perfectly clear. Oh, God, Neddy, your poisonous tongue, Miranda said with a groan. You could flay a person alive. Were you so afraid of loving her that you had to hurt her? 
he was silenced. She really did know him far too well, better than he knew himself. He closed his eyes, unable to bear the simple truth. The silence lengthened. And then he heard her slide off the bed, cross the floor, and take his unwilling hand in hers. I'd sit beside you on the floor, the way I used to when I was young, she said softly, but I'd have trouble getting up again. Oh, Neddie, you've made such a mess of things. Yes, he said, not bothering to deny it. You can fix this. She gave his arm a little shake. But first we need to save Brandon, and then we'll see what we can do about you. I want you to be happy, love. You don't need an heir. We've got stuffy old Charles to take care of that. And if it's children you want, I've got babies to spare. Any time you want to romp with them, I'll bring them down to visit. He finally turned to look at her, a wry grin on his mouth. Your kindness personified. Don't try that with me. I know you adore my children, and they adore you. At times it was my only assurance that you hadn't turned into a cold-hearted fish. We can fix this, Neddy. You can have your happy ending, too. He wanted to use his poisonous tongue to blister her. But then Miranda had always been immune to it, and he had no real desire to hurt her. First things first, he said. We need to find Brandon. The Grand Master of the Heavenly Host was feeling well pleased with himself. To be sure, things hadn't gone as smoothly as he might have hoped, but the missteps and danger put a certain piquant edge to the whole proceeding. Who would have thought the Carstairs woman would have been quite so persistent? He'd had her locked in a room far away from the younger girl chosen for the ritual, and so far no one had come looking. If they had, they would find nothing. Ever since the collapse of the North Tunnel, he'd had the main entrance closed off and another opened in the old stables. He could just imagine the complaints from his congregation, as he liked to think of them. The thought amused him. They would be wallowing in proverbial mud once they reached the caves. They could certainly withstand ancient manure. They had already begun to gather. The ritual room was set, an altar erected with flowers and fruit and arcane symbols all around, as well as restraints and trays to catch the blood. He was hard with excitement. He'd never killed anyone before and a young virgin was going to be particularly enjoyable. The fools who made up the heavenly host would ooh and ah and commune in the spirit, wash in her blood, drink it if he insisted. They would do anything he wanted them to do once they drank the wine he'd doctored. He had no idea what the symbols that decorated the altar meant, but neither did any of them. They believed. He did not. That was the difference between power and obedience. He would have no choice but to kill the much too curious Lady Carstairs, but he could enjoy the impromptu nature of the act. Perhaps he'd have one of his followers wield the knife, or perhaps snap her slender neck himself. That was part of his grand plan, after all. It was gloriously simple. He wanted craved power. Power brought you everything you wanted. Money, sex, control. And he knew just how to acquire it. By witnessing the deeds he had planned for later that evening, every one of the members would then be culpable. A member of the House of Commons, known for his rants that went counter to sound business practices, could hardly keep his head up when confronted with the knowledge that he'd participated in a ritual murder. A young earl couldn't refuse to sponsor an admittance to an exclusive club or the suit of an unwelcome lover if threatened with exposure. He could have anything he wanted. He would be unstoppable all by dint of a bit of blackmail. 
He considered his choice of Brandon Rohan as executioner to be a particularly brilliant stroke. There was no way he could get someone like Viscount Rohan under his thumb. Rohan wasn't interested in the little games the Heavenly Host enjoyed, and he was impervious to blackmail. But when it came to protecting his baby brother, he would do anything. There would be no way in the world he would stand aside and let Brandon Rohan be tried and hanged for murder. Indeed, it had seemed ridiculously easy. It hadn't required much persuasion to keep Rohan's addiction to opium alive, and his rapid consumption of alcohol was benefited by the addition of certain substances that had been carefully preserved. Rye Ergot gave visions approaching the beatific, or the horrific, depending on one's frame of mind. If they came without warning, the effects could be devastating. He hadn't counted on young Rohan having enough of his brother in him to almost destroy his careful plans. He had set the details out for him last night. He hadn't wanted to tip his hand too soon. There should have been no problem. Young Rohan had killed before. He was a soldier, after all. And there were rumors of a distressing incident with some of the locals that had been hastily covered up. The Grand Master had been unable to find the details, but he hadn't given up hope. Sooner or later, nothing would be closed to him. But Brandon Rohan, sodden with drink and dazed with drugs, sat in his chair, staring dully at the ornate blade the Grand Master had had forged for just this occasion, and said, No, absolutely not. Not ever. In tones so clear, he might not have recently imbibed impressive amounts. The Grand Master wasn't one easily dissuaded, though, and he simply kept feeding the stuff into his unwilling proxy. All to no avail. He eventually passed out, the flat, monosyllabic words still on his lips. No. It was no matter. He would never know the difference. He'd had his servants cart Brandon Rohan's unconscious body to an opium den in the worst section of the East End rookeries. He wouldn't be found for days, if he was even found alive at all. His men had instructions to smear blood all over Rohan's cassock and tuck the blood-stained knife beneath him. As always, he'd been prescient enough to have two made. Rohan would awake and be convinced he'd committed the murder he'd refused to do. The Grand Master's only regret was that he wouldn't be there to witness the man's horror. But he had his own job to do. The cassocks decreed by the Heavenly Host were indistinguishable, and the hoods and cowls assured complete anonymity. All he needed to do was copy Brandon Rohan's dragging gait, and everyone would recognize the crippled war hero committing the crime. Truly, he'd planned it so well he astonished even himself. A quiet giggle escaped, and he slapped his hand over his mouth, lest someone hear him. But the only noise was from the trust form of Lady Carstairs, and he had plans for her. Very specific plans. 32. Never let it be said, thought Benedict Rohan, that sitting around waiting was any less heroic than charging into battle. It was a damn sight harder. He was trapped in his house with his meddlesome, far too acute younger sister and her blackguard of a husband, and he didn't dare leave. Eating alone in his room was too childish to be contemplated, so he had no choice but to sit at table with the scorpion and the woman he'd abducted and forced into marriage, and while nothing could induce him to be pleasant, there was simply a limit to how much boredom he could withstand. One way to alleviate that boredom was to fleece his brother-in-law out of every penny he had on him. Not that Lucien de Malheur wasn't a practice gambler. But when it came to Pharaoh, there were few who could beat a Rohan. Miranda reluctantly served as banker, 
more as a means to keep them from killing each other than in interest in the game. But the play was alarmingly even, probably because Miranda's husband cheated. The winnings went back and forth, well into the early hours of the morning, when once more Benedict consumed far more brandy than was good for him. But this time when he retired to bed, he was too drunk and too weary to want to kill the scorpion. He woke late, suddenly alert. He dressed hastily, even shaving himself rather than waiting for Richmond to make his appearance. And by the time he was downstairs, he decided that, wise or not, he couldn't wait in the house any longer. He was going out looking and be damned to the consequences. But Lucian sat at his dining room table, drinking coffee and looking perturbed, and Miranda paced the floor. Her face, when she saw him, was far from reassuring, but at least there was news. They found him, she cried, in some wretched hovel, and if it hadn't been for Lucian's connections, he probably wouldn't have been found until the middle of next week, if he'd even been found alive. Benedict felt his heart sink. Where is he now? They're bringing him, Lucian said, sounding equally grave. He's not in the best of shape, and my men have orders to be discreet, so it's taking a bit of time. Not in the best of shape? His wife interrupted him. He was in an opium den, Lucian, unconscious, and no one could rouse him, wearing a monk's robe and covered in blood. She started pacing again. Not good, Benedict thought, but he gave Miranda a reassuring nod. At least he's found. That's the first step. As for the blood, granted, that's not a good sign. But the actual ritual is set for tonight, so at least we know he's not going to be any part of that particular foulness. We may need to call a doctor to attend him. I've already sent word, the scorpion interrupted, looking grim. If my information is reliable, and I have no doubt that it is. He's in very bad shape indeed. With luck, the doctor will be here before Brandon arrives home. Dr. Tunbridge seldom comes out that promptly. I've summoned my doctor, not yours, Rohan, the scorpion said coolly. He's more capable of dealing with this kind of situation. I doubt old Tunbridge has ever seen a case of opium poisoning. It would have made things so much better if he could have simply slammed his fist into Lucien de Malheur's face, Benedict thought fondly, keeping his hands clenched at his sides. Except for what it would do to Miranda, who was already looking far more distressed than a woman in her condition ought to. She must have picked up on his hostility, for she shot him a quelling glance. Don't you dare! He opened his fists and held them up in a sign of surrender. I'll behave. Things are bad enough already. It seemed to take forever. The scorpion was right. The doctor did arrive before Brandon, but at least he didn't look like the shady quack Benedict was anticipating. Miranda kept herself busy by ordering the preparation of a sick room, sending servants running up and down the stairs, while Benedict took a chair as far away as he could from his brother-in-law, drumming his fingers silently and waiting. He lifted his head when he heard Miranda come back into the room with tears streaming down her face, and his panic erupted. What's happened? Have you heard something? His wretched brother-in-law stood at the same time. Is he back, my love? She nodded. The doctor is examining him right now. But it's bad, Lucian. Very, very bad. He's covered with blood, and he was found with a bloody knife, and he won't wake up. I didn't even hear them bring him in, Benedict protested, irrationally furious. Because they brought him in the back way, Lucian said in the tones reserved for an idiot. If he's involved in murder, we're going to have to be very discreet unless you prefer to have your brother hauled off to jail. Benedict didn't dignify that with an answer. When this is over, you bastard, you and I are going to have a serious reckoning. 
Lucian's scarred face curved in a malicious grin. I'll be looking forward to it. But in the meantime, do you suppose we might pay attention to what's important? Miranda hadn't exaggerated. Brandon lay on the narrow bed, his color dead white. The doctor had already removed the stained clothes, and Brandon's thin, scarred chest rose up and down imperceptibly. His skinny, claw-like hands were stained with blood, though Miranda was busy washing them clean. You shouldn't be doing that, Benedict said abruptly. We should call a servant or something. No, Miranda snapped. The fewer people who know about this, the better. Besides, I need to be able to do something. She reached out and brushed a shock of his dark hair away from his face. Poor little baby brother, she whispered, tears in her eyes. He's in rough shape, but he should make it. The doctor, a thin man with sad eyes far older than his years, murmured. The amount of opium he ingested has a depressive effect on the heart, slowing it down, and I feared it might stop beating completely, but it's already coming back, and his breathing is better. Even his color is improving. Benedict looked at the sickly yellow and white of Brandon's skin. His color is improving, he said doubtfully. You should have seen him when he first arrived, Miranda said. She glanced up at the doctor. What can we do? Watch him. As long as he cannot add more opium or anything similar, such as laudanum syrup, then he should continue to come back. Keep any sort of spirits away from him as well. Tie him to the bed if you must, but don't let him ingest anything more for at least two days. If you can, a full week would be better. Two days, Miranda echoed, incensed. He's never going to touch that filthy stuff again. The doctor looked at her sadly. In my experience, my lady, that's seldom the case. He's a habitual user, and while I imagine he started as a response to the pain of his injuries, he now uses it to shut out the world, and it's hard to bring someone back from that. Apart from his addiction, he's in one piece, no injuries, broken bones or the like. And the blood. Lucian spoke then, and the man lifted his head. I saw no blood, my lord, he said calmly. Lucian nodded. You'll be taken care of as per usual. Benedict's annoyance grew. He's my brother. I'll take care of any remuneration. If you'll tell me where to have it sent, doctor. He waited for the man to supply his name, but the doctor looked from the scorpion back to him and shrugged. We're better off without names, he said gently. And the scorpion knows how to get in touch with me. I leave it to you two gentlemen to sort out who pays. There was a cynical twist to his mouth, before he turned to Miranda and put a gentle hand on her head as she sat beside Brandon, clutching his thin hand in hers. Don't worry, dear lady. He'll be better soon, and then you may begin the hard work of convincing him to stay away from the opium. I wish you luck. She smiled up at him, but the man had already vanished like the ghost he was. At that point, Brandon's eyes fluttered open just for a moment, and then closed again. Not before Benedict saw the expression of clear panic in his bloodshot eyes. He's waking up, Miranda said, her voice brimming with excitement. Benedict had to wonder if his brother-in-law had seen that same look of horrified pleading. You need to come downstairs with me, my love, and have something to eat. You've been pacing and hovering for too long. But Brandon needs me, she cried, mutinous. Brandon has Benedict, who was more than capable of providing nursing duties, and most likely better at holding a chamber pot. And you, my dear, need to consider the baby and eat properly. 
You're not fighting fairly, she shot back. Of course not, my love. He held out his arm, and after a moment she rose and took it. But I'm coming right back, do you understand? she said stubbornly. You could do with a short nap. Then you may come back, and by then your baby brother will probably feel better able to withstand so much family and your dauntless enthusiasm. He put his hand over hers, leading her away. Leave this to Neddy. Benedict waited until they were out of earshot, stifling his irritation at the scorpion's mocking use of the pet name only his siblings were allowed to utter. When he turned back, Brandon's eyes were open and full of blinding despair. I killed her, Neddy, he whispered, his voice a painful rasp. I told him I wouldn't. I told him there wasn't anything that could make me do it, but I killed her anyway. Hush now, Benedict said, taking the seat beside him and holding the hand Miranda had abandoned. There was still blood beneath the fingernails, and he hoped Brandon couldn't see it. Who told you to kill her, and who is she? The Grand Master, he choked out. No one knows who he is, but we're all sworn to obey. But I told him I couldn't, not ever. But I must have. There was blood all over me, blood on my hands, the knife. But you don't remember actually killing anyone. It was a faint hope, but worth nurturing, for both their sakes. There was an almost imperceptible shake from Brandon's head. Not for sure. But I remember seeing her. Some poor serving girl, barely more than a child. And the things he ordered me to do to her. I couldn't, Neddy. But I must have. You were right the first time, he said soothingly. You couldn't. You don't have it in you. You're not a killer. You don't abuse women. His laugh had a ghostly quality. There's where you're wrong, Niddy. You have no idea of the things I've done, the horrors I've seen. I lost count of how many men I've killed. As for women, you don't want to know. It's been... I can't live with it. Even the opium won't drive the memory away, not completely. You don't need the memory as your burden, too. I'm a monster, and my face only shows what I really am. Benedict kept his expression blank. Brandon was right. He didn't want to know. But if his brother needed to confess, then he'd hear him. He reached out and smoothed the hair away from Brandon's pale, sweating face, much as Miranda had done. It's all right, old man, he said gently. Things are never as dark as they seem. Brandon's ghostly laugh was eerie. No, they're often a lot worse. He sank back on the pillow, closing his eyes. Forgive me, Neddy. For the first time in years, he wanted to cry. Nothing to forgive, baby brother. Trust me. Big Brother is going to fix everything. But Brandon had already drifted into a deep, dreamless sleep. At least, Benedict hoped so. The housemaid who'd assisted the doctor appeared in the doorway. You want me to sit with him, my lord? She whispered. Yes, thank you, Trudy. He blessed himself for remembering her name. He wasn't as good as he should be with servants, but he was better than most. Call me if there's any change. Doctor says he'll sleep twenty-four hours or more until that poison gets out of his system. I'll watch him and make sure he rests easy. Benedict nodded. A deep pall had settled over him, which made no sense. Brandon was back, safe. It didn't make sense that he'd killed the girl. It was too soon for the sacrifice. They would wait until the full moon, which wasn't until sometime tonight. 
which meant some poor child was imprisoned, waiting, and by tomorrow would be dead, and he could sit and do nothing about it, or he could do what he knew he must do, go to Kersley Hall and stop them. He heard the commotion as he started toward the first floor, a flurry of voices, and he stopped on the landing, frozen, as he looked into the pale, desperate face of Emma Cadbury. One of the footmen was arguing with her. His lordship is not at home to women of your sort, my girl. Go along with you. Richmond would have known better. Wait, Benedict said, coming down the rest of the stairs. The older footman turned. Your lordship, this woman was found sneaking around the house. She must have got in the servant's entrance, and she says she's looking for you, but Cook says she's one of those scarlet women, and she's got no right visiting a decent gentleman's establishment, lesson he's asked for her, which I figure you didn't, as you were worried about your brother, and— Your brother? Emma Cadbury broke through. What's happened to your brother? I don't think that's any of your concern, Benedict said stiffly. Did you sneak in here to see me? I couldn't think of any other way. I knew I'd scarcely be allowed in by the front door. Her voice was defiant. He considered her for a moment, then made up his mind. Come into the library, he said abruptly. That will be all, he added to the footman, whose name he didn't know. Keep my sister and her damnable husband away from us. But my lord, the man began, but it was too late. Benedict had already pushed past him and pushed open the door, revealing Lucien de Malheur with his very pregnant wife sitting on his lap, kissing him. Shit! It wasn't a word Benedict had ever used in the presence of a woman, but the circumstances more than called for it, and he said it again. Shit! What are you two doing in my library? Don't answer that. Don't I provide you with the bedroom, albeit against my will? Go there! Who's this? Miranda said, hopping off her husband's lap with surprising grace. The scorpion rose as Mrs. Cadbury entered the room, ever polite. You don't need to introduce me, my lord, she whispered. I know I shouldn't have come here, but I couldn't think of anything else to do. I would suggest you leave it up to me to decide who I introduce my sister to, he said acidly. Let me solve the problem and do the honors, Lucian said smoothly. My dear, I presume this is Mrs. Emma Cadbury, formerly one of the most notorious madams in all of London. Mrs. Cadbury, this is my wife, the Countess of Rochdale. Miranda gave her a dazzling smile. But you're so young! That's quite an achievement for one of your youth. And I collect you've retired. Miranda! Benedict groaned. She married me, Rohan, the scorpion said. She's used to all sorts of bad hats. Is that what I am? Mrs. Cadbury said wryly. It's better than some other things I've been called. But, Lord Rohan, I really must speak with you. You may as well do it in front of my sister and her wretched husband. What has Lady Carstairs done now? That's the problem, my lord. She's gone missing. 33. The day had gone from incomprehensibly bad to cataclysmic, Benedict thought with almost absent precision. What had started with worry over his brother and annoyance with his sister had flipped over into a kind of focused panic. They had Melisande, God help her. And God help them. He managed to keep his voice under control. What makes you think I know anything about it? Emma Cadbury gave him a look of withering disdain, something he deserved. I was hoping you would, sir. I was truly hoping she'd been fool enough to spend the night with you again and simply hadn't bothered to let us know. I could only wish, Miranda said wryly. But since she'd gone out in search of young Betsy, who disappeared, and she promised she was coming to ask you for help, it seemed odd that she didn't send any word back to us. 
She never would have abandoned Betsy for some shallow affair with a hardened rake, she said bitterly. She certainly had the hard part right, even if the shallow affair and rake part were far and away off. I never saw her, he said. Haven't seen her since two mornings ago. When she left here in tears, Emma Cadbury said bitterly, You bastard! He blinked in astonishment. He wasn't used to being called a bastard by anyone, much less someone so far beneath him in rank. Miranda jumped in before he could respond. Not precisely, but close enough. To make things worse, the damned fool's in love with her and refuses to admit it. I am so weary of pig-headed men and their stubborn natures. Lucy and Demolure laughed. You're not exempt either, she snapped. Emma Cadbury looked at Benedict with skepticism. I don't see any signs of love, my lady. I see a cruel, heartless pig of a man who used her and then sent her away, and— Enough! he thundered, and all was mercifully silent. I do not appreciate being called names in my own house. I am not a bastard, a rake, a pig, or anything else you women might think of. My love life is not open for discussion, no matter how interested you two are. Make that three, the scorpion tossed in, and Benedict sent him a bitter glare. He should have known someone like Lucien de Malheur would offer no loyalty, no male solidarity. And beyond that, I believe we should be more concerned about Lady Carstairs. Explain to me what happened, he demanded in a peremptory tone. But first, please take a seat, Miranda broke in. You don't offer a seat to a brothel keeper, Miranda, Benedict said. But she's retired. I don't want a seat. I want to find Melisande and make sure she's safe. I'm afraid she's gone after those men, and she doesn't even have your doubtful company to protect her. He ground his teeth at the word doubtful, but let it pass. When did she leave? Yesterday, in the late morning, she took a hired coach and the monk's robe we'd made for her, and she said she was bringing Betsy home, and that's the last we've heard of her, or Betsy for that matter. You could have come to me sooner, he snapped, a dozen horrifying scenarios racing through his mind. I assumed she was with you. That's what she told me. I should have realized that something was amiss particularly when you consider how distraught she was when she returned home from here the last time. Another stab to the heart, but he ignored it. Yes, you should have, he said icily. He glanced at Lucian. I need to leave. She must be at Kersley Hall, and it's growing late. I don't know if they intend to use her for their nasty ritual. I gather she's, uh, not a virgin. Miranda offered. That's not my fault, Benedict snapped. She was already a widow. Your lordship. Richmond was at the door, a pile of cloth in his hand. I thought you might be needing this. What? he demanded irritably. A monk's robe. I found it among Master Brandon's things and removed it, hoping it might stop his current activities. Not that it did any good. He wanted to hug the old man, but he simply grabbed the cloth and threw it over his arm. I have to go, he said again. Then go, Miranda said, waving an arm. Lucy and I will be close behind as soon as our carriage is readied, and I'm certain he can summon some of his less savory acquaintances to assist. She turned to her husband. Do you know where Kersley Hall is, darling? Generally, we'll find it, he said. Do you know when this supposed ritual is going to take place? Midnight. And don't even think of bringing Miranda. She's pregnant, for God's sake. You've known her all your life, Lucian retorted. Do you really think I have a chance in hell of keeping her home? Oh, you're a fearsome creature indeed, Scorpion. Stuff it. Your sister is enough to terrify anyone. Benedict ignored him, turning to his sister. 
Someone needs to look out for Brandon. I don't know that Trudy will be fully up to it. Mrs. Cadbury can do it. You don't mind, do you, Mrs. Cadbury? The doctor assures us he'll simply sleep the next twenty-four hours, but we'd feel better if someone was keeping an eye on him. Emma Cadbury looked like a cornered doe. I shouldn't even be here. Really, I must go. They'll be worried. You can send word home. And really, don't you think Lady Carstairs will want to see you first thing when Benedict brings her safely home? And he will, won't you, Neddy? He had no choice. Yes, please stay, Mrs. Cadbury. It would be a kindness. She nodded, giving in. What are you waiting for? Miranda demanded, in full warrior mode. We'll be there before midnight. How will we find you? There was no way to stop her, any more than he could stop the incoming tide. Make a commotion. Some kind of distraction that will draw the attention away from whatever this so-called master has planned. I suppose your sources didn't figure out yet who's running the heavenly host, he asked his brother-in-law. The scorpion shook his head. I'll keep my wife safe. Mrs. Cadbury will look after Brandon. The rest is up to you. God help us, Benedict muttered. The house was silent. Emma Cadbury sat alone in the Viscount's library, a tea tray by her side. She'd managed to drink a cup, but the sight of the tea cakes, so beloved by Melisande, had her on the verge of weeping with fear, and she had never been a woman to give in to tears. She'd simply covered the plate with the serviette. He was above stairs, sleeping. Lady Rochdale had assured her that he would be fine. A servant would fetch her if he awoke, but that was very unlikely. She had the direction of a doctor if he should suddenly get worse, but in truth all she had to do was wait. As if things weren't bad enough, she thought, trying for a wry smile and failing. On top of everything else, temptation was thrown in her face. She'd wanted to see him so many times in the past few months, ever since they'd whisked him away from the hospital, but there'd been no chance. She'd told herself it was for the best, and now here he was, sick, wretched, unconscious. He wouldn't know that she'd looked in on him. He was a boy. Despite all the horrors he'd been through, despite the determination with which he was trying to destroy himself, she could pray over him, but she never prayed any more. She was frightened, more frightened than she'd been since the night she'd run away, terrified that Melisande would have finally walked into a danger she couldn't escape, terrified that poor little Betsy would be slaughtered. Surely she deserved the one sweet respite of a look at Brandon Rohan's sleeping face, just to reassure herself. She moved quietly up the stairs. It was growing dark outside, the late spring evening coming on quickly. The servants were out of sight, as good servants were supposed to be. Even the kindly old man who'd brought her the tea had told her he was going down for his own supper— but all she had to do was pull the bell if she needed assistance. It was as good a time as any. She moved up the stairs quite slowly, half hoping she'd think better of it. But the closer she came, the more she knew she couldn't turn back. His room was at the end of the hallway, and while the door to the hallway was closed, she could see dim light coming from under the door. Lady Rochdale had told her a maid would be stationed outside, but the chair was empty. She moved up and pressed her ear against the door, only to hear absolute silence. And then a hideous thump. She slammed the door open in time to see Brandon Rohan hanging from his neck in the centre of the room, the chair he'd been standing on kicked over. She rushed to him, holding him up so the strain on his neck was eased. You stupid, stupid fool, she cried. Damn you to hell! Stop this immediately! He'd fought her for a moment, kicking at her imprisoning arms, and then he stopped moving, 
and she had the horrifying thought that his neck had already been broken. She looked up, tears streaming down her face, to find he was looking down at her, his dark eyes puzzled, the noose loose around his neck. She reached out with her foot, blindly, catching the edge of the chair and pulling it over. It took her three tries to get it upright, and she set his feet on it, relinquishing her hold as she pulled out the knife she always carried with her. She climbed onto the chair with him, reaching high over his head to cut the rope, and suddenly realized his arms had come around her, and he was looking at her as if he'd seen a ghost. My harpy, he whispered. And then he collapsed. 34. If he rode any other horse but Bucephalus, he would not have made it. He went hell-bent, through uneven roads in the murky darkness, and he cursed the rising of the moon, knowing it only brought disaster closer. But Bucephalus was as sure-footed as ever, with nary a misstep as he raced through the night, so fast that the spring dew had no time to settle on his shoulders. He pulled up short at the copse where he and Melisande had left the horses the other day, ignoring the stab of fear. It was a good thing his sister and her husband were following, though he could still wish Miranda had stayed at home. He could hardly carry Melisande home on his horse again, much as he'd like to, and there was the young girl as well. Besides, Miranda could be very comforting to those she wasn't related to, and annoyed with, and there was a good chance Melisande or the girl would need a woman's care, but God, he hoped not. Brandon's robe fit him well enough. They were of a height, though Benedict was broader in the shoulder. And he considered limping, pretending to be Brandon if anyone should spot him. Ah, but whoever had set his brother up would know perfectly well he wasn't, and that was the main person he had to beware of. He contented himself with hunching slightly to disguise his height, and moved through the night like a ghost. There were perhaps a dozen robed figures wandering the empty paths of Kersley Hall, but to his surprise they weren't heading toward the entrance in the old dairy. The building was pitch dark, the doors shut and barred. Instead they were heading toward the stable in the midst of muffled laughter and drunken conversation pitched too low for him to hear. He had no choice but to follow them, back into the deserted stable where a man held the lantern aloft. Each acolyte who passed him and disappeared into the stall had to suffer torchlight on his face, and Benedict drew back, ducking into one of the darkened stalls. He could hardly expect to gain admittance if he had to show his face. He had no history with this new, more secretive version of the Heavenly Host, and given Brandon's recent involvement, he'd definitely be persona non grata. There were too many people around to stop him if he tried to force his way. At least he could be relatively sure that nothing had happened yet. Whoever the mysterious master was, he would wait for a full audience. He couldn't imagine how people could stand by while a child was slaughtered. He recognized Ellesmere's drunken laugh and his lady wife's admonition. They were hardly people he cared to spend time with in the normal run of things, but he couldn't believe they would be a party to something so hideous. He'd believe everyone was mistaken, but he'd seen the blood on Brandon's hands the torn cassock on the floor with its ominous dark stains. No, this was very real. It seemed as if he waited forever, but in fact it was probably less than ten minutes. The slow stream of robed attendants came to a halt, and when he lifted his head there were no lights coming from outside. Only the guard at the distant stall remained. He moved back out of the stall, into the night air, and circled around, satisfying his suspicion that the last of the heavenly host had arrived. There was a door at the opposite end of the stable, near the guard, leading out toward the overgrown woods. They thought no one would approach from that side. 
They relied on their distance from the city for protection. They were wrong. He would have liked nothing more than to beat the guardian monk to a pulp, but he couldn't afford the time. He made do with the manure shovel, smashing it over his head so the man went down in a sprawl of limbs. He recognized the face. Some pimply-faced young squire up from the country, no doubt looking to join the ton. He took the robe belt off him, noticing in disgust that he was naked underneath. It only made sense. He was expecting an orgy. Benedict tied the boy's arms behind his back, looped the rope around his ankles, and left him truss like a chicken. For good measure, he took his handkerchief from his pocket and shoved it in his mouth to keep him quiet before depositing him in one of the other stalls. And then, picking the lantern up in a calm hand, he started down the steps into the tunnels. He held the lantern aloft, looking around him. This entrance was past the one they had used a few days ago, and he assumed they would be gathering in the large central room. He peered into the dark behind him, but there was no trace of light, and he moved forward as quietly as he could in case there were any latecomers. The tunnel opened out into a room, one they hadn't seen before. It was lit by a few smoking torches, the shadows adding to the ominous feel of the place. The room was smaller than the gathering hall, with lower ceilings and numerous alcoves arranged for licentious purposes. Long, low tables were set out, laid with cold meats and breads, wines and ale, and another with a bizarre assortment of fruit and vegetables as a centerpiece— consisting mainly of grapes and something pale. And then he caught his breath. The centerpiece, festooned with grapes, was indeed something pale. It was the completely nude body of a woman, a familiar, gorgeous body. Melisande. He leaped for the table, half afraid he'd find— But she was alive, breathing, in one piece. Her arms and legs were bound, tied to the table, and they'd put her on a huge platter with bits of greenery around her and dark purple grapes placed at strategic places on her. Her eyes were open, and she was staring up at him in mingled fury and entreaty, and he realized they'd gagged her. Never a bad thing, he thought, half giddy with relief as he began unfastening the restraints. Melisande had struggled so hard the knots were impossible to undo, so he simply took his knife and cut through, hoping he wouldn't slice her as he did so. The moment her arms were free, she sat up, pulling the gag from her mouth and throwing it while he cut through the leg shackles. And then she launched herself at him, ignoring the knife he still held in his hand, almost knocking him down. He caught her, all that lovely naked flesh— pulling her into his arms and crushing her against him, kissing her opened-mouthed and hungry. She was shaking all over, her eyes wide and shocked. I thought you wouldn't come, she whispered. I was so afraid. He wanted to reassure her, but he was too busy kissing her, and she was kissing him back, her hands pushing the cassock away, fumbling with his clothing. He caught her wrists, frowning down at her, but she simply struggled. I need you, she said, her voice thick with tears. I need you to. They touched me. They put their filthy hands on me and I can't stand it. I need you to wipe out the feel of those awful hands. Please, Benedict. He was past rational thought. Fury at her words washed through him, as well as lust that he knew he should ignore. But her hands were desperate, and he'd been so frightened, and he pulled her back into the shadows, into the darkness, and pushed her up against the wall. There was no time, no need for preparation. She was wet, he was hard, and he simply released himself from the breeches, lifting her up and bracing her against the wall, before he thrust into her with a grunt of satisfaction, feeling her tight around him. He wanted to slow down, Afraid he might hurt her, but she dug her fingers into his shoulders. No, 
she whispered in his ear. Don't stop. I need you. Hard. I need you to take me. Harder. He knew what she wanted. Something to blot out the horror of what she'd been through. Something to drive her into oblivion and beyond. She had no use for tenderness right then. She needed domination, and he gave it to her, slamming into her, and she absorbed each thrust with an inner clutching, wanting more, needing more. He felt the climax sweep through her, hard and fast, followed by another. But he wasn't ready to stop. He wasn't ready for her to finish. He put his hands between them and touched her, covering her mouth with his. He'd wanted to make her scream with pleasure, but this was the wrong time and place. He needed to fuck her in silence, swallowing her cries, and he did, sweating, his body shaking, his legs wanting to give way, her own wrapped so tightly around him that he wanted to die from the pleasure of it. Her final climax was his undoing, and he let his seed spurt inside her, reveling in the feel of it as he had the time before, not worrying about the consequences. Breaking all the rules he held so fiercely and not caring, needing to fill her, own her in the most primitive manner. Still clutching her, he collapsed against the wall, leaning his forehead against hers while he tried to get his breathing under control. Her own was coming really fast, and her heart was still slamming against his. He could feel the stray shudders dancing through her body, squeezing him, and he knew if he stayed like this he'd get hard again. And that was one indulgence he didn't dare claim. He moved his mouth to her ear, biting the lobe with just a faint nip, and she came again. He wanted to laugh. Light-hearted at such a desperate moment, but if he did, he'd slip free from her, and he wanted to stay locked together for just a moment longer. Are you all right? he whispered. He felt her momentary hesitation, but the fear had left her, the shock and disgust. Splendid, she said dryly. At least, slightly splendid. He smiled against her face. I'll never think of grapes in the same way. She shoved at him then, and he withdrew, letting her down carefully. She was glaring at him, and he was relieved as well as distracted. He quickly rearranged his clothes, telling himself to stop thinking of her like that. At least she didn't have the vulnerable, frightened expression. He much preferred her as a virago. Give me your robe, she whispered. I can hardly infiltrate them dressed like this, and they're expecting you to be naked. Of course, I can't figure out why they would have trussed you up and just left you. An army of them must have walked by and barely seemed to notice you. They're drugged, she said briefly. That explains it. No competent male would ignore a woman like you. It wasn't working, and he knew it. Give me the goddamn robe. He'd been about to relinquish it, but her tone made him stop. I need it more than you do. Why don't you hop back up on the table and lie still? With luck, they won't see you on the way out, either. Her hand caught the rope belt, yanking him against her. If you think I'm in the mood for this, you're wrong. Give me the robe. He relinquished it reluctantly. Not so much because he needed it, but because the sight of her naked body was something normal and beautiful in this eerie, evil darkness. He was dressed in dark clothes, usual for him, and he blended into the shadows well enough. You need to go back up. I'll find Betsy and bring her up as well. You don't even know her, Melisande whispered. How many children will they have trussed up and ready to sacrifice? I really don't know. His momentary good humor, thanks to the release of sex and the assurance that Melisande was safe, vanished. He looked down at the woman who somehow mattered to him in ways he wasn't going to think about, and frowned. You're not going to leave and head for safety, are you? Not when someone's life is at stake. I assure you, 
the person most likely to die a horrible death tonight will be whoever started this whole mess. Wasn't that your ancestor? The original organization was a far cry from the cruelties and mad plans of this current group. Whoever's behind it isn't going to make it through the night. He's convinced Brandon he murdered a young woman. He's done everything to push Brandon over the edge. And I'm going to kill him for it. She surveyed him for a long moment, then sighed. Lovely, she said in a caustic voice. Before you avenge your brother, could we please rescue Betsy? He'd done something wrong again. He knew it with dismal certainty, but he couldn't afford to stop long enough to figure it out. Another female on his coattails, another female he wanted safe at home, in bed, in his bed, another female he cared too much about, try as he might to drive her away. I don't think so, he murmured, and before she realized what he was doing, he clipped her across the jaw with a perfect fist, dropping her like a stone. He caught her before she landed on the hard-packed floor. Years of training in the pugilistic arts had finally paid off with the best hit of his life. If she hadn't caved, he didn't think he would have been capable of hitting her again, even to save her life. He'd never hit a woman in his life, would never have even considered it. But to save her life, he'd do anything. He held her in his arms for a moment, looking down into a peaceful face. I'm so sorry, my darling, he whispered brushing his mouth against hers. But I refuse to risk your life. You can kill me later. Holding her tight against him, he moved to the farthest alcove, laying her down on a bunch of cushions clearly marked for more licentious activity. He should probably take back the robe, but he couldn't see leaving her naked and defenseless. He only wished there was enough time to get her back outside again, but he daren't take the chance. He took the rope belt and wrapped it around her wrists, loosely, so that she could untie herself if he didn't come back. There was no guarantee he'd be successful, but sooner or later his sister and the scorpion would show up with reinforcements. He might despise his brother-in-law— but he had absolutely no doubt that Lucien de Malheur would make hash of these aristocrats and their putative master. She looked so peaceful, and he wished to God he could just take her and run, leave the rest to Lucien. But he couldn't. He'd promised her, and even if he hadn't, he could scarcely leave a child to such monsters. He drew back, and then, before he could change his mind— he turned and strode out of the room, down the endless warren of tunnels to the quiet buzz of noise that was slowly growing louder. She waited until his footsteps died away, and then she opened her eyes. She knew she should be angry enough to kill, but at the moment she was past that. She sat up, reaching her bound hands up to her jaw, wiggling it a little. It hurt. He'd hit her hard— and she hadn't been feigning her collapse. By the time he'd caught her, she'd gathered her disordered senses, smart enough to know that fighting him would be a losing battle and only delay him from getting to Betsy. So she kept her eyes closed as he carried her into this place and tied her wrists. Kept her eyes closed as he'd kissed her, so sweetly, with more gentleness than he'd shown her so far. He'd called her my darling. Did he mean it? She didn't have time to consider that, either. If he loved her, she'd forgive him for trying to knock her out. If he didn't, she was going to kill him. She tugged at the rope around her wrists, then used her teeth, pulling it free with surprising ease. So he would avenge his brother and probably ruin his own life, but he didn't give a damn about her, trussed up like a Christmas goose. She'd been forced to lie there as they poured her, and she'd been desperate for anything to get the feel of their hands off her. He'd done the job quite effectively, and even now, beneath the enveloping monk's robe, she could feel his seed sticky on her legs, and she wondered if she would go through another ritual scrubbing when she finally got home.
or whether she would let it remain, knowing it was the last time he would touch her. She managed to scramble to her feet, only the slightest bit shaky. She knew she couldn't indulge that shakiness, and she started after him, her bare feet cold on the hard stone floor. As she passed the table they'd trust her to, she realized she was starving, and at the last minute she plucked a bunch of grapes to take with her. No one, no one could crush her, no matter what they did. She might fall apart momentarily, but she was ready to fight once more, and she wasn't going to let a perverted group of randy aristocrats terrorize her. She didn't bother to consider why he'd come after her. She could only be glad he did. The monk's robe still retained his body heat, delicious around her chilled skin, and his spicy scent lingered. She wouldn't give this back, she thought, even though it symbolized everything horrific about the group she was determined to wipe out. It smelled like Rohan and like a lovesick adolescent, she wanted to hold on to it, cling to it for safety. She could hear the noise of the chanting from a distance. There was no sign of Rohan, and she felt an icy chill sweeping through her body. Had they caught him so quickly? Was he now lying trussed up as well, one more offering to whatever strange god they seemed to worship? She held her breath, praying it wasn't too late. She'd been insane to stop long enough to... What would he call it? To fuck him. That's what it had been, plain and simple. Well, perhaps not so plain and not so simple, but it had hardly been making love. Her fear and need had blinded her to the much more important task. Saving Betsy's life. By the time she reached the hallway approaching the large gathering room, the myriad candles were sending out bright pools of light into the darkened corridors, and she could see Benedict ahead of her. He'd set the lantern down, pressing against the side of the cave, disappearing into the shadows. He was so busy concentrating on the scene in the vast room beyond that he hadn't noticed her arrival. She stopped where she was flattening herself against the wall. She had to face the unpleasant fact that he was, at least this time, right. She needed to be out of the way so she didn't distract him. The odds were bad enough without her getting in the way. She held her breath, waiting, and then she closed her eyes and began to pray. 35. Benedict leaned back, not moving. The chanting was loud and mindless, in some kind of pig Latin. He could only hope his sister and the scorpion had moved quickly. Things were rapidly getting out of hand, and if he didn't get out of here alive, then someone would need to rescue Melisande. At this rate, time was running out. Has someone joined us? A smooth, oddly familiar voice carried from the chamber beyond and Benedict cussed beneath his breath. Scratch that. The time had come. And without another word he strode into the center of the great hall, grateful at least that Melisande was safely out of the way. The chanting didn't stop when he walked into the room. They didn't even seem to notice, though their faces, hidden in the depths of their hoods, were turned upward to watch as they knelt around the perimeter but he wasn't interested in the mind-addled mad monks. It was the center of the room that caught his attention. The young girl lay spread out on what could only be an altar. She was wearing a lacy white dress, and her hair was clean and flowing around her peaceful face. He could only hope that whatever drug the so-called Grand Master used on his acolytes had been given to Betsy as well. She'd be a lot easier to deal with if she were unconscious. The man stood alone in the middle of the room, cowled, hidden like the coward he was, an ornamental dagger in one hand. There was something that resembled a tray surrounding the platform where the girl was placed, presumably to catch her blood, and he didn't want to think what they planned to do with it. I was expecting you, the man said 
moving around so that the altar lay between them. He was limping badly, and it took Benedict a moment to realize why. He was pretending to be Brandon, wrapped in the enveloping monk's robe and hood so that his drugged followers would believe in his brother's guilt. Though I suppose you release that tiresome woman, I would have thought you'd had your fill of her by now. For an opening salvo, it was a weak one. I don't think that's possible, he said evenly, determined not to let the man bait him. But you wouldn't understand that, would you? The sentimentality of love? The Grand Master's voice was mocking. I have been spared that particular embarrassment. I would have thought you would be too, brother. You could always take her back to the banquet hall, feed her some wine, and she'll do anything you tell her to. By the time you come back, this will be over and done with, and you won't even be a witness. He didn't turn around. He had the sudden, unbearable suspicion that Melisande had managed to escape his makeshift bonds, but he couldn't afford to waste his time considering it. We found Brandon in that hellhole you left him. These idiots might think you're my brother, but I know better. Yes, but you see, they can't hear so well. They're in an altered state, thanks to the drugs I administered to their wine and the advanced practice of mind control. When they awake, they will only remember what they think they saw which is your crippled brother slashing the throat of an innocent girl and splashing them all with her blood. He heard a strangled noise behind him, but he kept focused. Damn the woman! But I'm not drugged, and I know who you are. He was rewarded with a familiar giggle over the maddening chant. Of course you do, old man. I wouldn't expect anything less. I have people coming, you know. You can't really expect to get away with this. Let her go. If you left now, you could get to the continent and no one would come after you. Why should I do that, when I'm about to have everything I want? His old friend said smoothly. You won't turn me in. Too many reputations are at stake. None of these impossibly high-born people want to admit that they were part of anything so shameful— but if you're the one to betray them, then I'm sure they will all testify that your brother killed this young girl. As for your so-called reinforcements, you don't have any. Most of the people you call friends are already here. Accept it, Rohan. I've won, and I'm only just beginning. He raised the knife high over his head and his cowl fell back just far enough for Benedict to see Harry Merton's smiling face. No! Benedict shouted, leaping forward and vaulting the altar. But not all the monks were as mindless as they appeared to be. Harry sidestepped him adroitly as two cowled figures came up behind Benedict, pinning his arms behind him. He didn't bother to struggle. He kicked at the man on his left, hard behind the knee, and the man went down in a yelp of pain, leaving only the second man to face Benedict's fury. He smashed a fist beneath the enveloping hood directly into the man's face, and he felt the crunch and splinter of bone, the spurt of hot blood, the skin split on his own hand as the second man let out a howl, pushing back the hood. It was Pennington, shrieking in fury as he fell back, and then it was only Harry Merton watching him from a short distance away. Calm, a cheerful light in his eyes, the ornamental knife in his hand. He was closer to the body than Benedict was, and he doubted he could move quickly enough to stop him. Come on, Rohan, old friend, Harry crooned. You've taken out my two best men. Surely you aren't going to give up now. Or do you realize I'll have this child gutted before you even move, and that will signal a bacchanalia that not even you can stop? You'll be pulled down beneath my followers, washed in her blood, and I can promise you, someone will slip a knife between your ribs before you have any idea what's happened. I'll take you with me, you bastard, he said, leaping for him, ready to rip his throat out. 
He heard her scream from a distance, Melisande, but he didn't stop, simply kept moving when the world exploded. 36. Melisande screamed, unable to keep still any longer. It sounded like the wrath of God, or the end of the world, and she buried her head as the ceiling disintegrated, dirt and stones and rubble pouring down around them. Something hit her hard between the shoulder blades, knocking the breath from her, and she coughed, struggling, trying to get to her feet once more, trying to reach Benedict. Slowly the tumbling rocks and sliding dirt halted, and so thank God did the ghastly chanting, though the garbed monks didn't move, still kneeling around the tableau. She finally lifted her head, her eyes searching for Benedict, but there was no sign of him, just a huge pile of rocks and dirt, and she felt hysteria rise in her throat. If he was dead, if he was hurt— and then a movement caught her eye, and she turned her head to see him at the altar, covered in dust as he rose to his full height, brushing the debris from Betsy's body. He'd covered her, Melisande realized in shock. In the last minute he'd leaped forward to try to save the innocent girl he'd insisted didn't matter, and it made her want to cry. She looked around for Harry Merton, but there was no sign of him and then she saw the legs sticking out from beneath the pile of rubble, and she breathed a sigh of relief. It was over. She started toward the altar and began to unfasten the leather straps, then stopped, looking overhead to the night sky above. A very pregnant young woman was looking down at them. Is everyone all right down there? Benedict looked at Melisande for a long, silent moment, and then he moved away from the altar, peering upward. That was a bit more effective than I expected, sister mine, he drawled, sounding only slightly rattled. Deus ex machina, indeed. We didn't know this was directly over you, Neddy, the woman said in an apologetic tone. Is anyone hurt? Only the right people. Harry Merton is dead. Miranda let out a shriek. God, no! Thank God, yes. He's the Grand Master. He moved to the sloping side, refusing to look at Melisande. Find Lucian. I want to get the women out of here, and the cave leading to the stairs has collapsed in the explosion. His sister disappeared and Benedict came over to the altar, moving Melisande aside with gentle hands before he finished unfastening Betsy's bonds. Ignoring Melisande, he scooped Betsy up in his arms and carried her to the side of the cave-in. Someone had found an old ladder, and it was lowered down. Benedict climbed the first few rungs with Betsy over his shoulder, passed her on to waiting hands, and then turned back to Melisande, finally looking at her. She raised her chin. What are you going to do about the heavenly host? Leave it to us. You don't have to be responsible for everything. He held out an impatient hand to her. Are you coming? No, I thought I'd stay here with the degenerates and the dead body, she said, angry once more. She slid off the altar, ignoring his hand, and heading for the ladder. She was halfway up, with him directly behind her, when she remembered she was wearing nothing beneath the enveloping monk's robe, and he could see directly beneath it. Tant pis, she thought. It would give him something to remember her by. The hands that caught her were strong and rough, and in the bright full moonlight she found herself surrounded by what appeared to be a gang of criminals. The pregnant woman had her arms around Betsy, wrapped in a blanket, and she was talking to her gently, soothing her. And for a moment Melisande stood still, feeling useless. Lady Carstairs? A rich voice came from beside her, and she turned to look into the scarred face of an otherwise handsome man. He clutched a cane, and she knew who he was. Mr. Brandon Rohan?
she inquired. He shuddered. God, no. Though I suppose we might as well be bookends, given our similar injuries. No, I can thankfully say that I have none of the wild Rohan blood in me. Only in my children. I'm Rochdale, and that very pregnant woman is my wife, the only female Rohan. Allow me to escort you to our carriage. Take your hands off a scorpion. Benedict's voice was deadly as he emerged from the collapsed tunnel. The man's smile was angelic. I didn't touch her, old man. But I thought you didn't want her. I... His voice trailed off, and Melisande felt the last of her elation vanish. She turned to Rochdale, or the Scorpion, or whoever he was. I would appreciate the kindness of a ride home, Lord Rochdale. I find I'm quite exhausted. The woman had brought the dazed Betsy over to her. She's all right, she told Melisande. She doesn't remember much, but she was worried about you. Oh, Betsy, Melisande murmured, pulling her into her arms. And I promised you'd be safe. Not your fault, the scorpion's lady wife said cheerfully. And she won't remember much of it anyway. The woman looked her up and down, assessing. So you're the woman my brother has fallen in love with. So much for the best laid plans. She peered at her more closely. You poor thing. You look done in. Let's get them back to town, Lucian. Benedict can follow after he's made arrangements for the clean-up. Her husband nodded. What do you suggest we do with the heavenly host? My thought would be to fill in the hole and leave them to rot, Benedict said, coming up behind them. But I don't suppose that would go over too well. And if it weren't for our parents' unwise involvement with the heavenly host, we might not be here. He looked at Melisande. I need to talk to you. Not now, Neddy, Miranda said firmly, taking Melisande's arm in one hand and Betsy's in the other. It can wait until you get back to London. She wasn't going to see him when he returned to London, Melisande thought fiercely. She wasn't ever going to talk to him again. He could jump in the hole with the rest of those degenerates and stay there, he could. She found herself handed up into a luxurious carriage, with Betsy coming after her and the ungainly Lady Rochdale following. You might stay and keep an eye on Benedict, my dear, she said to her husband. See that he doesn't tarry too long. I suspect Lady Carstairs' patience is running thin. The man looked resigned. Is there a horse for me to ride? I'm sure Jacob's men would have come prepared. We'll be waiting for you when you get back. The carriage started with a jerk, throwing Melisande back against the squabs. Betsy immediately curled up on the seat beside her and fell back into a sound, drugged sleep, and Benedict's sister looked at her across the darkened carriage. Neither of the lamps had been lit, but the fitful moonlight danced by her face, bringing it in and out of the shadows, doubtless doing the same to her own, Melisande thought. It was a strange way to hold a conversation she didn't want to have. And Lady Rochdale didn't appear to be interested in sparing her. I gather my brother has made a hash of things. She tried to stop her. Lady Rochdale, I've just been through an exceedingly trying few days. I've been hit on the head, abducted, abused, and watched a man die. Perhaps we could continue this conversation another time. You aren't going to want to hold this conversation another time, Melisande. I imagine I'll get nowhere near you. Might as well have it out now, while the wounds are still raw. I'm Miranda, by the way. Much easier than Lady This and Lady That, particularly since we're going to be sisters-in-law. That was enough to jerk Melisande out of her determined torpor. Don't be ridiculous, she snapped. All her customary good humor and good manners vanished in the extremity of the moment. He's done nothing that would force him into marrying me. What an odd way to put it, Miranda replied. 
and I'm afraid you're wrong. He certainly has done something that would force him to marry you. He's fallen in love with you. Melisande mentally counted to ten in a vain effort to regain her shattered self-control. I must warn you, Lady Rochdale, that I am very close to screaming, and I wouldn't want to disturb Betsy. Miranda, Benedict's sister corrected, undeterred. As I said, he made a hash of it. Perhaps I might explain. It's tedious of him and very male. Men don't admit weakness, nor examine their feelings. They simply blunder, or in my oldest brother's case, snarl their way through life, pretending that nothing touches them when it's hardly the case. It's his wives, you see. She didn't want to hear this. But short of putting her hands over her ears and singing loudly like a stubborn schoolchild, there was nothing she could do to stop her. He's still mourning his dead wives, yes, I can imagine. That's not it. Annis's death took the joy from him. Barbara's death finished it. But he mourned them and released them. He's simply terrified that it will happen again that he'll fall in love and marry, and his wife would die in childbed once more. Melisande laughed mirthlessly on the edge of hysteria. I don't believe it. He was all set to propose to Dorothea Pennington for the sole purpose of creating an heir. He seemed perfectly willing to do that. Because he didn't love Miss Pennington. Melisande was struck dumb. That's rather awful she said finally. Yes, it is. I never said my brother was a kind man, though compared to my husband, he's an innocent lamb. However, to be frank, I don't think I could bring myself to mourn Dorothea Pennington over much myself. The Countess's frank words startled the laugh from Melisande. It was rusty, odd, but it was definitely a laugh, when an hour ago she would have wagered she'd never laugh again. That's better, said the Countess. You, on the other hand, he couldn't bear to lose. So he drove you away. I won't ask how, but I expect it was with his nasty tongue. As I said, stupid of him, but at times all men are stupid, particularly when they are in love. Would you stop saying that, Melisande begged. He's not in love with me. Allow me to know my brother better than you do. He's most pathetically, desperately in love, even if he refuses to admit it. And I expect you love him, too, or you wouldn't be so hurt and angry. I'm annoyed, Melisande said stoutly. Apart from that, I simply don't care. Liar, said the Countess. She peered at her closely. Or perhaps I'm wrong. I love Benedict so much know his strengths and his frailties so well that I assume anyone with discernment would love him too. I have no discernment whatsoever. Miranda smiled then, the doubt in her face vanishing. You need to punish him, not yourself, Melisande. The only way you're going to get a chance to do that is to marry him. 37. Melisande slept. She awoke when the carriage pulled to a stop. Dazed, she realized the door was being opened from the outside and the steps let down. Betsy was handed out into liveried arms, and she knew they were in Berry Street. She stayed where she was. I would prefer to be returned home. I don't think Betsy can handle much more at this point. She needs a bed and a period of sleep. Indeed, Betsy was making fretful, sleepy noises like a fractious child, which indeed right now she was. And your friend is waiting for you here. My friend? Mrs. Cadbury, Miranda clarified. Emma would never come here. She did when she knew you were in danger. I prevailed upon her to wait for you and to keep an eye on Brandon. He's in bad shape, poor lad, from the opium and whatever else that beastly Harry Merton pumped into him. 
If you insist, I'll summon the carriage to take you all home again. But first, please come inside for a bit. Benedict is still in Kent. You don't need to worry about running into him. That, at least, was true. And she had already discovered that it was almost impossible to fight the Countess of Rochdale. To her shame, her legs felt weak as she climbed the front steps, and it was the very pregnant Countess who supported her, not the other way around. Once inside, the Countess immediately became efficient. Richmond, would you have a nice warm bath poured for Lady Carstairs? She's covered with soot, and she's had a trying night. And is there any chance some of my old gowns might still be here? I'm afraid her ladyship has lost her clothes. The elderly butler bowed, his seamed face impassive, but she remembered him and his kindness. It will be the work of a moment, your ladyship, and I believe I might interest you in good hot tea and sugar cakes, might I not? His lordship has required that Cook keep a supply of them on hand since your first visit. Melisande looked at him for a moment, uncomprehending. And then finally, finally, she began to cry, as the countess folded her into her arms and the butler beat a hasty retreat. There, there, my pet, she murmured, her pregnant belly a third party between them. It's been dismal, I know, but a hot bath, fresh clothes and tea will make all the difference. By the time Benedict returns, you'll have the upper hand, and he'll have to grovel. It will be delicious. Melisande managed a watery laugh. Richmond, where is Lady Carstairs' friend? She went back to the dovecote. That is, back to Carstairs' house, my lady. She left a note for Lady Carstairs, said she'd understand. How odd, Miranda said. And Master Brandon? He had a fall. Not sure how it happened, but Mrs. Cadbury found him, and we brought the doctor back in. He's a bit the worse for wear, but getting better, though he's a bit banged up. Melisande could feel the tension in Miranda's arms. Then I'd best go sit with him myself, she said calmly. See to Lady Carstairs, please, and find a nice warm bed for the stray lamb over there. Betsy was sound asleep on one of the chairs in the hallway. Yes, madam. I should go home, Melisande began once more, but the countess stopped her. Enough, she said. It's been a trying night for me as well, and in case you didn't notice, I'm in an interesting condition. Indulge me in following Richmond. He'll take most excellent care of you. She stopped arguing. The Countess, of course, was right. The warmth of the bath was restorative in the extreme, soothing away not just the grime and dust from the cave-in, but the aches in her muscles and the remnants of that fast, rough coupling in the empty rooms at Kersley Hall. She knew she should rush through her ablutions, dress and force her way home before Viscount Rohan returned, but she couldn't bring herself to move, staying in the tub until the water grew cool. It was the Countess's personal maid who helped her dress in the clothes that were a bit too tight. Melisande was taller than the Countess and more robust, and had no interest in being tightly laced, but still, being properly dressed helped enormously. There were no shoes that would fit her feet, but that was the least of her worries. Things had been so desperate she hadn't even considered her ankle, but it was swollen and throbbing after the abuses of the past twenty-four hours, and she had no intention of walking very far. She took the tea and sugar cakes in solitary splendor in the bedroom. Once the bathtub had been removed— and the maid returned to her mistress. Emma's note was on the tray, but it made little sense. Just a bunch of vague excuses and a promise to explain everything once she returned home. It should have galvanized her into leaving. She poured herself another cup of tea. Eventually, she heard his footsteps on the stairs, taking them two at a time. 
they could belong to no one else. The earl limped, and the servants would take the back stairs even if called upon to hurry. She knew who it was, and she braced herself as he slammed open the bedroom door and stood there glowering at her. He was covered with soot and dirt, though he'd made an effort to wash his face. He smelled of night air and horse and sweat. He smelled of spices and warm skin and everything she wanted. She sat there, waiting. No children, he said abruptly. She blinked. I beg your pardon. I'm only considering this because presumably you're barren. There'll be no children, do you understand? She understood, the Countess's words coming back to her with blinding clarity. She should make it easy for him, help him. But in his case, her charitable instincts had long dried up. Considering what? she said calmly. He ran a hand through his hair and was rewarded with a shower of dust on his filthy jacket. Marriage. It's the sensible thing to do. Sensible? Hardly. You need an heir. I can't provide you with one. I've already told you it makes a great deal more sense for me to be your mistress. Absolutely not. You're going to marry me, and the hell with an heir. I have two brothers and a nephew who could inherit the title. An heir doesn't matter. Then what does? For a moment he didn't say anything. And then he moved so swiftly he shocked her, crossing the room and sinking to his knees in front of her, yanking her into his arms with a fierceness that belied the fact that his strong arms were shaking. You'll marry me, he said, his face buried against her shoulder, because I love you, damn it. Against my better judgment, against my will, I adore you, every square inch of your perfect pink skin, every word from your mouth, every foolish, pig-headed thing you do. I've done my best to drive you away, but I can't keep my hands off you, and on top of everything else you make me laugh. I love you, and I'm tired of fighting it. But what if I don't love you? He lifted his head, looking honestly astonished, and she laughed at his utter incredulity. Don't worry. I love you, she said. I just thought I'd torture you for a moment. He kissed her then, full and hard and deep, his tongue against hers, heat and desire rushing through her. He threaded his hands through the curtain of damp hair that hung around her shoulders, and he broke the kiss to bury his face in it, groaning. I'm so filthy, he said. I stink of dirt and horse and sweat, and you're so clean and sweet. I can always take another bath she murmured, reaching up to unfasten his buttons. Epilogue It was a rough night in Somerset. Benedict, Viscount Rohan, was being forcibly held down on a sofa in his study as his father poured him another tall glass of good Scots whisky. He handed it to his son-in-law, better known as the Scorpion a man tolerated because his daughter adored him, and eyed him warily. Whiskey's the only thing for it, he said. Indeed, Lucian replied. So I've discovered. Drink up, man, he said to Benedict. It'll be over soon enough. The storm was howling outside. Inside, Benedict was wild-eyed and desperate, but there was no way his father or Lucian would let him leave the room, and he knew he could simply ride Bucephalus over a cliff come morning. No, he wouldn't do that to such a fine beast. He'd hobble him, and then jump himself. It didn't matter how. If he had a sword, he'd fall on it, in fine Roman fashion. But for now, all he could do was get as drunk as he possibly could. How bad is he? Charlotte, Marchioness of Haverstoke, stuck her head in the door. She was a fine-looking woman, even at her age. Her red hair streaked with grey, 
her eyes full of compassion as they surveyed her eldest son. I expect he's a sight worse than your daughter-in-law, Adrian replied, smiling at her. Charlotte nodded. He looks it. Won't be long now. Momentary concern crossed Adrian's face. The girl. She's all right, isn't she? Strong as a horse, Charlotte assured him. Just keep on with the whiskey. It was near dawn when the door opened once more. Benedict, stubborn bastard that he was, had simply refused to pass out. But he was sitting there mumbling, planning all the ways he would end his life now that he was certain his wife was gone. He's pathetic, Miranda observed as she walked over to the fire. Don't be so harsh on him, darling one, Lucian said. He's had a hard history. Not any more, she said briskly. She popped him out easier than I do. She touched the light swell of her eighth, and she hoped final pregnancy. Him? It's a boy, then? Adrian lifted his head. He'd imbibed his own fair share of the whiskey, as had Lucian, and none of them were in any great shape. You have a grandson, Charles Edward, after your brother who died young. For a moment, Adrian blinked, and it had to be the whiskey that brought the tears to his eyes. Whose idea was that? he said gruffly. Oh, Melisande's. Benedict wasn't going to come up with the name. He was that certain he'd be burying her and the little one. And they're healthy. Listen for yourself, Miranda said, holding the door open and a loud, lusty wail came down the hall. Benedict lifted his head, suddenly astonishingly sober, despite all the Scots whiskey he'd ingested. Miranda smiled at him. Come along, my brave one. Your wife and son want to see you. This concludes Shameless. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.